expression want to extend a, a hearty welcome to um, the legislators that are in the room. Um, it's uh, an important topic that I'm going to uh, discuss this morning, and uh, I'm really glad to have you here. Before we get started, I want to turn it over to uh, Susan Barrett, the Executive Director of the Report. Thank you, Mr. Chair. I don't know if these microphones are working, but I will speak loudly. They're not. They're not. They're not. Okay. Um, we're working on it. So I have a, a couple of announcements. Uh, first on scheduling for our April 10th meeting. We have flip-flopped the agenda. So in the morning, we're going to be hearing from our own staff on the all peer model implementation update and the total cost of care update. And then in the afternoon, we'll hear from hospitals on um, enforcement hearings. And then I'd encourage folks to check out our website and our April schedule because we have ha we've added several additional hearings throughout the month of April. The second thing I wanted to inform the board and the public on is uh, yesterday the uh, Data Governance Council of the Green Mountain Care Board met. This, for folks who may not know what the Data Governance Council is, is a sanctioned committee of the Green Mountain Care Board. Its uh, duty is for stewardship of our databases that the board owns and oversees, which are the All Care Claims database, better known as WeCures, and the Hospital Discharge data set, better known as BUDS. Uh, yesterday, the council voted to approve the, their new principles and policies, and then we also reviewed some updates to the VCURES rule, and it, at next meeting in June, that board will vote to approve the updated VCURES rule. That rule then will come to the full board and then work through the process at the legislative le level for rule updates. And that is all I have to update you on. Thank you, Susan. The next item on the agenda are the minutes of Wednesday, March 27th. Is there a motion? I move to approve. I'll second been moved to approve and seconded to approve minutes of Wednesday, March 27th, without any additions, deletions, or corrections. <coughs> any discussion? Seeing none, all those in favor signify by saying aye. 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 Any opposed? So now we'll get to uh, the real purpose of this morning, and I'm going to turn the uh, introduction of the panel over to um, Robin Lund in just a minute. I just want to uh, personally thank um, Robin. Um, she is the incredibly talented person that put this all together this morning. And uh, it's uh, a, a great position to be in when you're chairing the Green Mountain Care Board because you have an incredible staff of truly dedicated public servants. And then you get to work with four incredible colleagues. And, and Robin is the epitome of that uh, incredibleness that we witness every day. I first met her almost two decades ago when she worked for legislative council and she still continues to amaze me to today. So what we're going to talk about today is really the plight of rural hospitals. And I just wanted to quote, uh, before I turn it over to Robin, uh, a couple uh, sentences from a February 19th Navigant analysis that was published. And um, what that analysis said is rural hospitals are essential to the health of the 60 million Americans who live in rural communities. Beyond providing care, they're also economic engines, often the largest employers and drivers of additional businesses and jobs to communities. But for close to three decades, rural population growth has been significantly lower than the urban areas, a factor contributing to the closing of nine to five rural hospitals across 26 states. And I learned from a uh, conversation with Eric last night that it's now, what, 102 here? So the economic effects are immediate. A study found that when a community loses its hospital, per capita income falls 4% in that region and the unemployment rate rises 1.6%. So what was interesting also in that article is that Navigant um, didn't list any hospital in Vermont at risk, so they haven't even caught up to uh, some of our recent challenges. So with that, I'm going to turn it over to Robin. And again, thank you, Robin, and thank you. I'm sure you're going to thank John Olson. Yes, uh, absolutely. Uh, thank you, Kevin. Uh, my mic isn't working, so I'm going to try and talk loud. Also, before we get, begin, I would like to thank 
Representative Lippert and Senator Lyons for making time in their busy committee schedules to have their committees attend this morning. I appreciate that. Um, I do want to thank John Olson. Uh, John Olson is the Chief of the State Office of Rural Health and Primary Care. He was instrumental in helping us coordinate this morning's discussion. Uh, with funding from HRSA's Rural Hospital Flexibility and other grants, the Rural Health Program at the Vermont Department of Health works with statewide and local partners to support and enhance healthcare delivery services for rural and underserved Vermonters through quality improvement, workforce in incentives, and financial sustainability. So without the Department of Health's uh, help and support, uh, we would have had a, a much, uh, much tougher time pulling this panel together. So thank you. Uh, I also want to thank uh, the many hospital CEOs and hospital personnel who took time to come here today to start to begin this conversation of, around rural hospitals in Vermont. Uh, I think we need that perspective. And I also want to thank, I see in the audience, many other healthcare providers and representatives of healthcare providers, and I also want to thank you for coming as well. Uh, the purpose of today's panel on rural hospitals is to is to really deepen and broaden our understanding of the challenges and opportunities facing Vermont's hospitals and to learn more about what's happening in the national context and the national pressures. Uh, we know, as Kevin said, that there's a number of rural hospital closures around the co country, and we've been fortunate in not seeing a closure to date, but we do know that several of our hospitals are having financial challenges and that we as a state are not immune to the, the many pressures uh, facing hospitals around the country. Uh, my hope for today is that the discussion will help inform uh, all of us, both here at the board and our regulatory duties and decision making as we move towards our enforcement hearings on 18 and setting hospital budgets for 2020, but also that it will help inform discussions that, quite frankly, have already started at the Vermont State House. Uh, where the House has passed a bill establishing a rural health task force that is currently scheduled uh, to be taken up in Senate Health and Welfare. So I hope that our pan panel is timely and helps contribute to, to those discussions as well as discussions around the state and the communities. So with that, uh, I want to introduce our panels, my apologies, our panelists, my apologies to them because I'm going to shorten all of their bios in the interest of time. Um, so our first speaker will be Eric Schell. Uh, Eric is a leader in supporting rural health care uh, as we transition, as the country transitions to population health. Uh, he works at Stroudwater Associates, where he is uh, the leader of the firm's rural practice and chair of the firm's uh, board of directors. Um, he has 30 years of experience in healthcare financial management and consulting, and he is a frequent featured speaker at rural conferences presenting on the future of rural healthcare, critical access hospital reimbursement and reimbursement issues, as well as rural hospital performance improvement. Uh, he works with a number of different states who uh, have HRSA grants to support this kind of educational initiative, um, as well as with rural hospitals. Uh, then we'll have Jeff Tiemann, who is the president and CEO of Vermont Hospital and uh, Vermont Association of Hospitals and Health Systems, VAS, with which he joined in 2016. Um, I think probably most folks in the room are familiar with, Boz, with Jeff and his role at VAS. But prior to VAS, Jeff was the chief of staff for the Catholic Health Association in Washington, D.C., a national organization representing more than 700 hospitals. He worked there for 12 years where he managed the office of the president and CEO, directed strategic planning, and led the organization's messaging on the reform and the Affordable Care Act. And then earlier in his career, uh, he was a reporter for the Washington Health Care Magazine. Uh, then we'll, we'll have Kevin Stone, who is the interim chief operating officer of One Care of Vermont. Uh, Kevin Stone is oh, the interim, sorry, chief Sorry, Chief Executive Officer of One Care Vermont. Uh, One Care, as I think most folks know, is a statewide ACO founded in 2012 by UPM and Dartmouth Hitchcock Health. Uh, One Care is currently implementing uh, Vermont's All Care Model ACO program. Um, and prior to this role, Kevin served at Dartmouth Hitchcock as the Chief to the Executive Director of Managed Care and Contracting and as Southern Region Chief Operating Officer. 
Um, and then we have, we're fortunate to have two CEOs from two Vermont hospitals, Dan Bennett from Gifford and Steve Gordon from Broadway Memorial Hospital. Uh, Dan has served as president and CEO of Gifford since September 2016. Prior to that, he worked for 11 years in Waldo County Healthcare in Belfast, Maine, where he served as the director of community services for three years and chief operating officer for eight years. Steve is the president and CEO of Broadway Memorial Hospital. He has nearly 30 years of experience in healthcare and hospital management. Prior to joining the MH in February 2011, he was the president and CEO of Good Samaritan Medical Center in Rockford, Massachusetts, and uh, as chief administrative officer for Children's Hospital Boston and Waltham. Uh, so really what our, our format today is, Eric is going to start, he, as I said, he's going to provide an overview of the challenges facing hospitals around the country and strategies for weathering those challenges, really from a more national perspective, to give us that, uh, that, that way of understanding us in the con larger context. Um, Jen is going to provide some strategies from the American Hospital Association Rural Community Report as well as providing a Vermont context. Kevin is going to provide context from the perspective of the state accountable care organization and how health care reform uh, fits into the conversation. And then our two CEOs from Vermont hospitals are really going to bring it home with discussing what they're working on as a small rural hospital and which challenges and strategies resonate with them. So I'm going to stop talking now and turn it over to Eric. Okay. Thanks, Rob. If I just speak like this, can you hear me? Yeah. The background. Otherwise, I've got something in this hand, I've got something in this hand, and it's going to be a challenge. But um, first of all, it's an honor for me to be here speaking to you, Vermont. I very much respect what you all are trying to do here in healthcare. It's, it's, uh, it's truly remarkable. I'm, I'm working with Pennsylvania right now on the global budget payment system. And, and to come here, some of the things that, that you're doing, uh, you, you've taken what they've done and have already advanced it for years. So very impressive. But so, so here's, here's what my talk is going to do. Is, um, we're going to talk a little bit about where the industry is going and why it's going there. And then we talk a lot about challenges of rural hospitals. I look at the opportunities for rural hospitals. I think that there are a lot of opportunities for rural hospitals. And we'll talk a little bit about why I think that. And then also, the next part is it's the third part of a presentation. So where and why the markets are going, what the opportunities are for rural hospitals, and then the third part of it, what strategies do we have to do to make sure that, that we're, we're, we're there and we're successful as this thing unfolds? And so that's the talk. Um, usually it's an hour and a half talk. Robin said you have 45 minutes. So uh, buckle up. I'm, I'm originally from a small town in Western New York, so I can talk pretty fast. Uh, get ready. So uh, anyway, I'm, um, you know, just, just it's funny, uh, after listening to some of what you have going on here in Vermont and really kind of trying to get up to speed, I, I, I ended up waking up at 4.30 this morning and couldn't sleep because I'm like, how is this national talk going to apply to what you all are doing? And so well, let's, let's see what happens. I mean, if, if this, this is what's going on everywhere else. You guys can try to figure out, I think Jeff's role is to figure out how to tie what I do to, into what you're doing here in Vermont. Kevin's also. So anyway, here, let's, let's go. So we've got... Yeah, let, me, let me figure this out. So we got a lot of things going on right here. We got a lot of, of things that 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 you know kind of have been rolling out over the last six or seven years, and and they're having very interesting effects on where we are in the rural market. And I would suggest it's it's these are some of the underlying causes of what we're seeing. This this craziness, schizophrenia that we're seeing in the marketplace. And, and they go everywhere from the high deductible health plans to underinsurance to macro, you know, the whole physician fix. And all of these things are pieces of it. Now, I just want to touch base on some of these. Um, first of all, the high deductible health plans. You know, we can all remember the day, at least I think we're all you know, gray hair out there, we can all remember the day in which we used to say, we're not going to fix health care until we can tie in the patient, to the, it, we can tie in consumer um, purchases to the hip pocket. Well, guess what? We have now 63, or was that 68% of small businesses high deductible health plans. The reason why that's relevant is because small businesses what's in most of our rural communities. And, and so now we can no longer say we do not have the consumer, the, 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 the purchaser of healthcare services tied to the hip pocket. Uh, and think about the effect. I mean, how many of us in this room have high deductible health plans? And has it changed the way you consume? I, I absolutely, it's changed the way I consume, it changes the way everyone. 
And, and, and we start to think about the demand, especially for that more elective outpatient services, going to the physician, you generally think twice. Um, and this is something, again, that's just new. This is just in 2009, we only had 42%. We've had a 50% growth in those high deductible health plans. We've had reduced readmissions. Older slide. So at one point, these, these, these admissions, this was all revenue to hospitals. And as that trend line of readmissions come down, what was once revenue is, is coming out of the system in terms of, um, of inpatient care. Now here's a slide that you see, you, you're the only, oh, you can hardly see it. Here is the trend line with the United States in terms of admissions per thousand. And it's going down about one and a half percent a year. Here's Vermont. <clears throat> You guys just eat way too much healthy food <laughs> for a long time. You know, I'm giving this talk in Louisiana next week. The number starts at 148 and it goes down to 120 at this point. So you guys, I, I don't know. <laughs> anyway, um, but, but you know, so, so what's interesting is, is a lot of our big hospitals, where 60, 70% of our business is on inpatient services, and we see this, this trend line, and it's been doing this for the last 30 years. We're seeing this decline in inpatient admissions, a big volume, a big revenue generator for our hospitals, and we're seeing that trend line go down. And, and so, you know, kind of a big thing. Macro, we all felt the effects of macro. Um, I look at macro, right, this, so this is the whole movement in a way to engage physicians in alternative payment models, advanced alternative payment models, as well as, uh, you know, kind of, you know, those that are not participating in advanced payment models are now going to be scored relative to their peers on four different uh, uh, kind of uh, measurement domains, and, and they're going to get a score, and it's going to affect payment. So, so we all know about this, this is old news, but here's what I find interesting about the whole uh, rollout of, of macro. First of all, we used to talk around the timing of the flip, but you know, the tipping point of when our payment goes from fee-for-service to population-based and value-based payment. I look at the tipping point somewhere, somewhere out past 2022 when the risk of staying in fee-for-service is essentially an 18% differential in physician payment, the grassroots of our healthcare, our sick care system. Uh, so the timing I see when the tipping point, when we really hit a point where we're going to move fully into value-based payment is somewhere right around here. So, so let's just say that's 2024. We're right now at 2019. Anyone that's doing a three-year strategic plan, you're halfway into this flip to this new payment world. The second thing I would say is anybody thinks that just because we have this administration in Washington, D.C., that we're going to go back and just stay on fee-for-service, the macro was pure kind of the facts that Congress came together, Republicans and Democrats came together and said, we are going to move health care. We are going to change. We're going to change the payment system. And that means a whole lot. And we'll talk a little bit about the incentives here in terms of the different payment systems in a minute, but it's meaningful. And so, so again, the, the, the timing of when the, 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 this tipping point hits around moving payment and, and the fact that we're not going back. Those are the two pieces that I saw coming out of the macro the legislation. And so, so we think about that. We live in this world, maybe not in Vermont, of price times volume is net revenue. Right? Price times volume is net revenue. Pretty straightforward calculation. You look at a lot of the things that are going on here. Um, uh, macro, the whole um, measurement, the MIPS measurement around um, uh, cost containment. You look at the reduced readmissions. You look at the high deductible health plans, where now consumers are tied and want to actually you know, think about twice before going to the doctors. There's a fundamental attack on the, on the volume equation. Price times volume is net revenue. Volume is under attack here. And so what do you do? Oh, it's easy, right? You just increase price. How's that working in Vermont? <laughs> So all of a sudden, price times volume net revenue is not, you know, it, it, it gets to be an interesting calculation. The Affordable Care Act passed a long, long time ago. Gosh, nine years at this point. Um, but there are pieces of it that I think are really important. There's three pieces of the Affordable Care Act that I think are, I think are still relevant. First, more people have insurance, right? We've got 32 million more people with insurance. Now, in the last, gosh, um, 18 months, we've lost 7 million from those roles of the, um, of, of the insured. And, and as we're starting to see that, unfortunately, creep back up. But more people have insurance. First part of the Affordable Care Act. I look at the impact on rural. One is that 
you know, rural has always been kind of documented as the, you know, group of group uh, and other studies that rural is the highest percent of under and under, un, under and uninsured population relative to urban area. So now if everybody theoretically has insurance, is not rural a more interesting marketplace for others? I would suggest yes. The second piece is have insurance, will travel. And we're seeing that in our rural hospitals, where 70% of the business drives right by our front door uh, to the major cities. So the first impact of the Affordable Care Act, and this is the one that's being politicized, and it's, it's, uh, everyone's talking about it. But here's the, here's the one that I consider this the carbon monoxide of, of the Affordable Care Act. And it's this right here, the update factors, Medicare update factors. Medicare says we're looking at market basket, 2.9%. Then we're going to take off if overall across the industry, a lot like we do in, in Vermont here, if there's a gain in productivity, we're going to take that off the top of the rate increase. And then we're the government, we can take another 0.75% off because we can. And so, so how does that, so, so that's a big one. Then all these other dollars came out. But, but let's, how does that look like from a, from a legislative or from a regulatory perspective? Here is the rate increase for rural hospitals last year for inpatient PPS. This is the rate that you're receiving. A 1.1% increase in your inpatient rates for hospitals paid under um, the DRG, the PPS, uh, fee-for-service payment system. 1%, 1.1%. Outpatient, outpatient rates went up 1.35% for 2019, and physician payments fee, you know, price went up 0.13. Now, the average cost last year for hospitals went up 5.5%. If your average reimbursement from your largest payer went up on average somewhere around 1.3 or 4%, all of a sudden, price relative to cost is going down. How does that look? So, so now let's go back to this equation. Price times volume is net revenue. When price is going down relative to your cost, what do you do? Oh, it's easy. You raise volume. But wait a minute. Didn't we just talk about volume? <coughs> now what do you do? What do you do now? And here's, here's a, you know, Kevin, Kevin here appropriately termed this. This is called the risk of staying in fee-for-service. These are your Medicare margins. Remember how I said that Medicare says we're going to look at market basket, then we're going to take off gains of productivity, then we're going to take off another 0.75% off of that because we're the government and we can? The cumulative effect of that is really starting to take shape. In 2017, the average rural um, negative Medicare margin was 6%, negative 6%. And, and in 2013, it was a positive 2%. This is the accumulation of all of these 0.75s coming off the system. And frankly, I, I just read uh, um, yes, yeah, yesterday, I read the uh, uh, MedPAC just issued its March 15th report to Congress. And one of the things that MedPAC, uh, two interesting comments. One, they project, so for, for non-rural, the overall hospitals, the negative Medicare margin is negative 9.9%. They're projecting that rate to go to negative 11% for this year. Negative 11%. In the language, what they literally say in the, in the report is that we are going to continue to put pressure on the fee-for-service payment system until we get people to flip. I paraphrase what, in, in this big, long study, but that's exactly what they're getting at. This, as Kevin coined it, is the risk of staying in fee-for-service. So, so what do you do? If price is going down relative to cost, if volume's coming down, what do you do? And, and the third part of the Affordable, Affordable Care Act kind of addressed some of that, where, where it said, you know what, the government said, hey, we're going to put out, you know, we're going to start measuring quality. We're not, no longer just going to pay for feet, um, um, uh, util, uh, quantity anymore. We're going to tie quality strings to this, a lot of things, reduce readmissions and value-based purchasing and all of these programs. <laughs> And then we created this thing called the, account, uh, the, uh, um, uh, the ACO, the, the Accountable Care Organization. And does anyone remember when the Accountable Care Organizations were introduced back in March of 2000, I believe it was 11. It came out, and do you remember what the, the market said about the ACOs? They said, they're never gonna fly, we're not gonna see them. They're like unicorns, they're not gonna happen. 
And then what happened? And what happened was we have 40% of total fee-for-service beneficiaries now in an accountable care organization. What happened? How did the market get this so wrong that these ACOs now are, are a dominant player within our, within our Medicare pay payment system? How did this happen? And ultimately, for those of you, the, the whole concept of an accountable care organization, it's a budget-based payment. So it's, it's, it's reimbursement tied to a budget based on prior year total dollars spent per beneficiary. It's a, way from, you know, it's a movement away from just the fee-for-service price times volume net revenue to a reconciliation to a budget. Sounds like a little bit similar to what you all are doing here. And so look at, look at the growth. We had all of these growths. Every year, CMS comes out with new accountable care regulations and rules. Uh, this last year, uh, going into effect for July 1st of this year, they're going to, uh, essentially ACOs are going to have to take a downside risk. Up until this point, there was only a few ACOs that were taking on that downside risk. But, but now, we're, now and, and so we continue to see rules, you know, the improvement in the rules. Here's the trend line on ACOs. And again, I ask you the question, why are we seeing this? <laughs> the market said they weren't going to fly, and they did fly. And, and why is that? Here's, I, I like to show this. This is an, old, this is an older one, but, but there's an important point I want to make here. I'm going to start to build the case for the importance of rural hospitals with this slide. And, and, and the reason why is, so the physician ACOs are the, the dark blue line. The hospital system ACOs, uh, and this was aged, it is aged, are the red line. And at, at that point, we saw physicians getting into ACOs at the same rate that the large systems were getting into ACOs. And, it, and you think back, and originally there were studies saying it would cost a million dollars to get into ACOs. Why are physicians willing to kind of get into this? And, and, and so you know, the, the, it really comes down to, you think, so I, I, there was a the group of, there was a 10 um, site, uh, primary care group out in Nebraska, uh, all primary care doctors. They decided they wanted to get into this ACO. First year, they got right into it. And you start thinking, okay, why would a large, you know, multi-site primary care group practice want to get into an ACO? And, 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 and you know, so you start, why, why, why would they want to do that, spend all this money? Here's, here's the answer. How much of the total Medicare spend, let's say it's $10,000 a year, for you guys it's probably like 4,000, but the rest of the country it's like 10,000. How much of that 10,000 do you think is actually spent in the primary care physician's office? 10% maybe? Not much. Six? Six percent. Six percent is spent. And I'm a primary group, I get six percent of the spend with an ACO, with a gain share model, with no downside risk at that point, they get a play on the other 94%. In other words, if they do something to better care for their patients, create health within their population, or otherwise reduce costs, they get 50% of what they save. They have this incredible lever. And rural hospitals, frankly, have a similar level or, or lever because Anywhere between 60 and 70 percent of the spend is spent outside of rural communities. And so rural hospitals have this similar lever as well. And so again, the primary care physicians with that, with that incredible lever all of a sudden said, wait a minute, let's sign up for this because I want to play on that other piece. I can't control all of that 94 percent, but I can influence some of it. I want a piece of that. And so we started seeing primary care physicians getting into the ACOs. And, and then this came out. This came out a couple of years ago. Um, Previa Health, anyone familiar with Previa Health? It's a large kind of physician conglomerate down in, um, 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 outside the Capitol uh, in, in, in Washington. And, and, and what they do is they, it's a kind of the old MSO model, the Management Services Organization, where they, they, they allow physicians to remain an independent practice, but be part of a larger organization that has, had an ACO. And, and we think about, okay, they, so they, they, they have this ACO, and then they got this $400 million, you know, essentially, uh, you know, contribution so that they could create a national expansion. And guess who they got that $400 million contribution from? Anyone familiar with Goldman Sachs and Company? <laughs> Wall Street. 
what is Wall Street doing putting $400 million into an organization that, that you, know, you know, physicians, allows physicians to remain in independent practice, but then uh, participate in ACOs or something like that. So here is it, A or B? A. Wall Street heard that primary care physicians are underpaid relative to their specialist peers and wanted to get the primary care physician compensation up. <laughs> or B. Wall Street found out about the lever and decided they could make money on the lever. <clears throat> Wall Street, you know, and, and there's others. Allidade is another one. I was at a critical access hospital in North uh, East Mississippi that the three physicians that are primary, admit primary admitters to this one critical access hospital, they all became part of this Allidate, same management service organization with an ACO. Every dollar that those physicians keep out of that, that hospital, they get 50% of on the savings with no risk. So all of a sudden, you know, physicians are, are the primary care physicians are an interesting group and they're going after and people are going after them. So, so I keep going back to this question, Warren, I think you'll be familiar with this, uh, th this question of the, the market said the ACOs weren't going to happen, the ACOs happened, and why did that? What, what, what about this? Why did this occur? And, and it gets back to a study of, we were working with four critical access hospitals in northern New Hampshire, uh, Mr. West uh, uh, Hospital is one of the leaders of that, and um, they, they brought us in because they said, let's, um, we want to, we want to, we know we got to take out 10% of our cost to be in best position to be um, to, to kind of solve for this new world that's coming that we know is coming. And they created a shared service corporation in which they could get together as four hospitals and, and figure out ways to you know you know standardize uh, quality you know revenue cycle. They looked at all the different options of reducing cost. And when we ran the numbers, there was only about a two and a half percent savings, and they were shooting for 10%. So then the question became, well, maybe we need to look at the other side, the revenue side, and maybe we have to start thinking about a population health strategy. <laughs> and, and so the first thing we did is we said, okay, let's, let's do a 10-year pro forma, staying in fee-for-service of the four hospitals. And we had to make assumptions. In, in, in New Hampshire, for example, the patients are paid $250 to leave rural communities for outpatient surgery to get outpatient surgery in Concord, an ambulatory surgery center. We had to make some assumptions around that. We had to make some assumptions around the reduced, you know, kind of price that insurers were going to pay relative to cost increases. And, and so here were all the assumptions that we made here. And what happened, it became a holy cow scenario. Because here's what the combined financial performance of these four critical access hospitals was on an operating income and on a cash flow basis. And it hit me at that point, the reason why we started to see this incredible influx and, 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 and you know, adoption of these accountable care organizations is because people that were starting to look out beyond a one or two year budget cycle were seeing the fee-for-service payment system not surviving. It's a dog that won't hunt forever. And that's why we saw this incredible growth in, in the ACOs. People are saying, as long as I don't have to take risk, I want to be part of this new payment system, this, this population-based payment system. And, and, and I, would, I would attest that that's kind of what we're seeing right now. And, and for you all here in Vermont, to have a statewide ACO, and, and, and you created that, that with the first year or two of the ACO is absolutely insightful and, and visionary. So really, really applaud you for that. Um, and I, I just want to say this because, uh, again, we get back to a lot of people who are saying, well, are we sure we want to do this? You know, we had, new, we had administration come in, there was a change. Are we still going to continue on this path towards alternative payment models and, and value-based payment? And it became very clear last year when the director of HHS, um, uh, Secretary Azar, came right out and said, there's four things I'm going to do and I'm going to focus on to fix health care. And the one that I have circled here is use the MAC, use MACRA and CMMI, Centers for Medicare and Medicaid Innovation, to change the payment system. And if you start thinking about all of the things and the regulations and the inpatient rules and the outpatient rules and the physician fee schedule rules that have been rolled out in the last year, all of these are in line with this vision of essentially transforming payment. And I, I want to share you this because this is his deputy director of CMMI, who literally his quote was, we are going to blow up fee-for-service. 
And so blowing up fee-for-service, this is a big thing because we have all been really good at fee-for-service for a long time in our hospitals. And so some of the implications, you know, again, the Affordable Care Act, I look at it and say, you know, more people with insurance, absolutely, we've got that. The, the, the carbon monoxide of payment, you know, the, the overall, the, 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 the um, you know, kind of the destruction of fee-for-service through a thousand lashes, small lashes, is, is what we're seeing right there, that accumulating loss is going to continue to accumulate, um, that we're going to get people to move off of the dime. And then ultimately, the third piece of the Affordable Care Act is offering all of these new payment, alternative payment models to get people to think differently and to change payment. And so you know, I look at it, you know, so here, here's some you know, kind of definitions here. We've entered into a world in which we're competing for patient lives on quality <coughs> and cost. Okay, that's, that's the new world. That's the world that we're living in. And, and so it's this equation right here. Patient value is, is quality over cost applied to a population. We're trying to increase quality, reduce cost, apply it to a larger population. When we do that, we win. The, I look at an accountable care as a payment system. It's in a payment system, and, and this is a really important concept. It's a payment system where providers are able to monetize the value of increasing quality, reducing cost. Okay, so think about that. Providers, so accountable care is a payment system. And we'll use population, we'll use all of these different words, but you know, essentially accountable care payment system, providers monetize the value of increasing quality, reducing cost, applied to a larger population. And it takes lots of different forms. It, you know, bundled payments, value-based payment, provider self-insured health plans. Or think about that, provider, if we come together and we start managing the cost of our own employees, we improve their, their, their health, their outcomes, we benefit from that. Providers monetize that value. Um, Medicare ACO, which you guys are all in, and then ultimately the capitated provider-sponsored health plans, the Kaisers, the UPMCs, where the providers are taking that residual claim on health. And, 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 and I always get to this point, and there's people in the room saying, yeah, didn't we do this? It was called managed care. It went away. We put our heads in the sand. It went away. And isn't this going to happen again? Isn't this just, aren't we just going to go back? And, and this is why I think this is for real this time. First of all, we got the incentives right. And I'm a big believer in incentives. In other words, back in the day, the accountable, or excuse me, in the managed care era, who monetized the value of increasing quality, reducing cost? Insurers or providers? Insurers. Who had the greatest ability by multiple factors to affect quality and cost? Insurers or providers? We had the incentives completely wrong in the managed care era. No wonder it failed. It, it frustrates me in some of these states that I travel around in where they've gone back to MCOs to manage their Medicaid program. They're going back to a model that failed and it's very likely to fail again. Uh, the government's all in this time, right? Back in the day when we did managed care, we did it all for 20 to 30% of our payer mix. Now the government's saying, hey, we're gonna blow up fee for service. We're moving in this direction. We have new information systems to manage quality and cost. You know, back in the day, managed care, you know, we were all waiting for claims uh, runouts. If we were working with the insurers, IPAs, those types of things, we wouldn't get data for six months to see how we, you know, kind of affecting quality and cost. Agreed upon evidence-based protocols. We have science now and, and, and a body of knowledge and, 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 and agreed upon procedures where providers can hold themselves accountable to, to <coughs> science-based standards of care different than it was in the managed care. And the last one is going back is not an option. This is to me is the most important one. When premium, when family and premiums got over $20,000 a, a year, at some point it got too much. And this is the effect of that. As price increases, you're going to have substitution, basic economics, supply and demand. With price continuing to go up, Substitution is going to affect. Essentially, what Jeff Bezos and some of these other folks, uh, uh, Jamie Dimon, uh, they came in and said, Thank you very much, healthcare system. We don't think you're going to get it solved. We're going to solve it for you. And I think this is scary because the, the combined balance sheets of this organization. <laughs> 
they, 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 they're so significant that, that I don't really know if we've all really thought about the effect that this is going to have. And, and, um, but ultimately, they said, you know, here's what we're going to do. We're, we're going to reduce the health care costs um, while improving outcomes. But he said, first, that we're going to do it for our own organization. And, and when we figure this out, we're going to roll it out to the rest of the country. I think we here in this room, we have an opportunity to disrupt this. But it's going to have to be taking some costs out of the system. The substitution effect. And that's why the things are different. So here's where I want to talk a little bit about the value of rural hospitals. So you guys can get excited here for a second. We talk a lot about the plate. You know, I listened to the NPR article about you know, Vermont. Here's where I think that the value in rural hospitals are. So back when the regs for the ACOs came out, as I was reading them, uh, there, was, there was one line in the regs. And this was like March of, March of, uh, of, of 2011. And it said this, it said a hospital, or it said a primary care physician can belong to one ACO, hospitals and specialists can belong to multiple ACOs. Okay, so I'm an Arthur Anderson trained accountant. Why did that one line jump out at me as, as the, you know, essentially the, you know, here's the value for rural hospitals. How many times can you attribute revenue to an organization? Unless you're an Arthur Anderson trained accountant and work for an Enron. <laughs> Once, right? How many times can you attribute expense? You can cut up expenses, pass it around. What that one line just said, right? Rural ho or, uh, primary care physicians can belong to one ACO, hospital specialists can belong to multiple ACOs. That just told you about who are the revenue centers in the new world and who are the expense centers. Your primary care base are your, are, are, are your revenue centers of the new world. I, I just need, oh yeah, good, I got this slide in here. I thought I, I, I ripped out 15 or 16 slides from my last presentation to try to get done in 45 minutes. So. But anyway, I look at a rural hospital as a primary care based delivery system. Average per capita health care costs in the United States a year ago were just north of $10,000. A busy primary care practice with 2,000 patients in it has a future healthcare market value of $20 million. A primary, a, a rural hospital that is aligned with a set of, say, five busy primary care physicians has a future market value of, of $100 million for direct costs of probably 25. We, our rural hospitals have built themselves around a primary care based model in which the value is here. It's the new revenue denomination. Any rural hospital that is aligned with their PCPs has a strong, uh, 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 you know, is efficient and high quality, has high value in this next world. We just have to figure out how to get there. And I, and I just, I, I put this up here uh, to show you yeah, we're going to be OK. Um, I want to compare and contrast fee-for-service to population-based payment, very quickly. In a fee-for-service payment world, all you know, costs start out very high. We have a lot of fixed costs, but every time we generate incremental volume, we admit somebody this afternoon in our hospital, our costs go up a tiny bit. They go up $100 a day, but our revenue goes up $1,500. So in the fee-for-service world, as we push out volume, the slope, the steep slope of the revenue line will ultimately catch the shallow slope of the cost line. Right? Fair, just basic economics. Any organization has high fixed costs relative to variable costs. In the fee-for-service world, the key is this revenue line right here, pushing volume out and increasing the slope of that revenue line, kicking it to the left. What's a great opportunity to kick that line to the left? How about this? Neurosurgery, cardiothoracic surgery, where orthopedics, uh, you know, anything that we can do to get paid more on a per procedure basis increases the slope of this line. So let me ask you, who benefited in this world? The big hospitals or the rural hospitals? Now let's compare it to a population-based payment system. How do we generate more revenue? What do we have to get more of? Patient lives. How do we get more patient lives? In most cases, lives are attributed to their primary care physicians. So we need more primary care, more busy primary care physicians. 
a rural hospital that aligns with a primary care physician, but fundamentally aligns with them, all of a sudden, $20 million, $20 million, $20 million. Guess what just became the new cost? Specialist technology and bricks and mortar became the new cost. Right? If you're not a revenue center, you're a cost center. Rural hospitals have an incredible opportunity in this new world, when they get there, if, uh, if they survive, uh, to, 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 to win in this. Just to realize their value that they have in this new world. And it's tied to the strength in their relationship with their primary care providers. And so what we've got to do is, here's, we've got to figure out a way to get from here where your primary care physicians, your rural hospitals were the lost leaders, to a world in which we are high value, and it's a population-based payment world. This is a really cheesy slide, <laughs> but there's some really important concepts here for everybody, and here they are. Be for service, very stable platform to live off of. We looked at it for 30 years. Price time volume is net revenue. We have perfectly aligned delivery system and payment system. The more sick care that we do, the more we make. Right, accountant, that's how I'm gonna think. The more sick care they do, the more we make. Everybody's aligned. Over here, we have a perfectly aligned healthcare system and payment system. The more healthcare we do, the less sick care we do, the more we make. And rural, oh, sorry. And rural hospitals have value out here. But what we have to do is figure out how to get here because we don't have a healthcare system. We have a sick care system. We don't have a health care system, we have a sick care system. It's going to take us years to create the infrastructure of a health care system to be able to get out and be comfortable here. All the, main, all the time, the payment system on fee-for-service is going to go down, the payment system on population-based payment is going to increase. This is the point of schizophrenia. Where our financial statements, you guys in Vermont have done an incredible job of moving that payment to, to this world of population-based payment. But how many of our financial statements in our hospitals, actually when you start taking volume out, show you benefiting? Show your cash increasing? Show your bottom line improving? That's the schizophrenia that we're talking about here. You guys, we, we, we ultimately, our financial reporting systems, I think, are what really are goofing us up. But we've got to figure out how to get from here to here, because this, I would suggest, based on the Medicare margins, this is smoldering. And once you step out onto this bridge, can we go back? I would suggest no. Are we going to go forward? I would suggest we have to. And I would suggest that it's going to get worse before it gets better until we figure this out. Now, a year ago, the, uh, the deputy director of CMMI, he defined what the payment systems look like going across this, this bridge. He said that column one, fee for service with no links to quality and value. And we put that right here. Column two, fee for service with now links to quality and value. I would suggest most of the country now is here. Fee for service with links to quality and value. And that would be here. That's taking a step. The next column is APMs, alternative payment models built on a fee for service architecture. I would suggest there's only one health system in the United States that isn't here. And because it, right, this is where the feet are right above the crocodiles because it's, we're built on a fee-for-service infrastructure. Everything we do to create health shows up very poorly on our financial statements, and then our board and our hospitals are not happy with the CEO. And then, then, then the last one is this, population-based payment built on a population-based um, infrastructure. There's one system in the United States that figured this out. It's called Kaiser. Kaiser says, we are successful when our beds are empty. Even folks like UPMC, right? When you read about UP, UPMC, uh, University of Pittsburgh, Minnesota, used to, they, now they've branded they're the largest insurer in Western Pennsylvania. They haven't figured it out because there was an article just recently, a month ago, that talked about the fact that they were underperforming relative to their expectations because the hospital business had lower volume, while the insurance business was, was actually profitable, the hospital business had lower volume. Well, wait a minute, what are we doing here? Are we working at cross purposes? 
Only Kaiser's figured this out, but I would suggest that this column right here is where we've got to go. And that would be, I'm sorry, that's right here. So we've got time, but it's moving and it's gonna get ugly before it gets better. The, uh, this is an important slide to me because this explains everything about what the future is going to look like. If you believe in the fundamental premise that form follows function follows payment, right? think about that, form follows function follows payment. Now think about the payment system of fee-for-service. The functional imperatives of a fee-for-service payment is number threefold. If one could manage one's own cost, utilization, and price, one could be successful. Think about that, right? If you could manage your own price, utilization, and cost, one organization as a standalone could be successful. And so what was the form that evolved out of that fee-for-service payment system? We had a bunch of ones competing with other ones for utilization, for market share, for services, that resulted in a, you know, so the fee-for-service essentially is a disaggregating payment system. Now turn that around and say, we're moving to this accountable care payment, population-based payment. Think about the functional imperatives of that. To be successful in that world, there's some things that we have to do. One, we have to aggregate scale. To truly diversify insurance risk, you probably have to be north of 80,000 covered lives. To truly diversify insurance risk. Because right, providers have to take that residual claim on health. In order for this to be successful, if providers don't have an incentive around health, we're not going anywhere. They're gonna be crosswise, just like UPMC, hospital insurance is. And so if, if providers are gonna take this residual claim on health, they've gotta be able to diversify that insurance risk. So, you know, covered lives north of 75,000, let's just say. The second thing that they do, if we're gonna to manage the health of an entire population, can one organization do that as a one? Or do we have to engage others? Tertiary, rural, primary care, specialists, uh, nursing home, post-acute care, uh, public health, ambulance, assisted living. All of these become part of a, of a population-based payment system. So again, form falls, function falls, payment, the functional imperatives of a population-based system are fundamentally different than those of a fee-for-service. And they are going to create an aggregation of healthcare and sick care resources under a common umbrella. <coughs> this slide, like I said, I think this slide, as simple as it is, explains so much of what we're seeing across the country. When we're seeing this, this everyone's coming together right now. Diversifying insurance risk and creating the systems to care for a population. And so here is, in the last six minutes, I think it's, we're out of time, right? Uh, in the last six it's minutes, it's a chair. What? It's up to the chair. I've already told you, Eric, I'm going to let you go. <laughs> well, I think because we started it. Uh, I was given 45 minutes, so we'll finish in 45 minutes. Um, this right here, I had the, the, the chief medical officer of the Georgia Hospital Association so talks about Eric and his shaky bridge. He said, this is the concrete path across the shaky bridge. So if you, if, will you give me four minutes to explain this to you, because I think this is so important to how we think about the future. Um, and and let, I'll, I'll explain it. So, so what we have is, here's the payment systems evolving from fee-for-service, so this is, this, is, um, this is the fee-for-service with quality and utilization. This here is that right above the crocodiles. Alternative payment models built on a fee-for-service architecture, and this is where we start to stable it out. In the end, providers are gonna be taking that residual claim on health. In other words, Kaiser's, Geisinger's, UPMC's, those types of systems where insurance and providers come together as one. In order to do this, we have to kind of transform three of them. We have to, this, this section up here, is health or sick care. We have to transform our sick care system. We have to create a health care, the blue bar in the middle, is create a health care system, and we have to proactively pick up and move payment. Again, in Vermont, you guys have already done that, some of that. Um, and so, so there's three initiatives. The orange bar is the strike point. When the initiative hits the strike point, you implement. The first one is operating efficiencies, quality, patient engagement. We got to do that today because the payment systems are definitely here at this point. We've lost 102 rural hospitals. I haven't figured out the payment systems flipped. 
and they haven't tra transformed themselves. Think about taking 5% out of your cost structure and focusing on your quality. The second is you align with your primary care. And we have to do that by the time the payment system gets out to here. And that's because the revenue centers of the future are your primary care. If we don't align with them, somebody else will. You know the largest employer of physicians right now? United Healthcare, Optum. They figured it out. So we better align. So we better plan to align to align. The second is service area rationalization. This is coming together in larger systems to create the systems of care for a population and diversify insurance risk. So today, we can create the strategy, we create an implementation plan, and the strike point is out here. Ultimately, taking 5% of your costs out, here we're going to take 15% out of your costs. The costs that we take out, we're going to take half of it and plow it back into creating a healthcare system, which is here. The other half, we're going to give back to the GDP to reduce the risk of substitution. We got to create a health system, patient-centered, and everything we do here in this phase cannot have a negative impact on fee-for-service. Because if it does, we're going to shoot ourselves in the foot. So we can build our patient-centered medical homes. We can develop case management, care management, your data analytics, evidence-based protocols, all these things that we can do here. Out here, hotspotting, value, creating that value attribution model, which I understand you all are working on here. Payer and provider networking. So think about creating a health system as walk, or crawl, walk, run, sprint. We don't want to come out here sprinting, because if we do, we're toast. We're still living in fee-for-service. And then we got to proactively pick up and move payment. And, and right now, you know, in, in this world, in, in Vermont, you guys have actually taken it up a notch. But right now, your self-funded health plan, you know, all the quality and utilization incentives that the commercial payers have out there for you, participate them. Take the dollars and invest them in your health care system. Um, you know, here's your transition payment models. This is the ACO, the, the, the model of Kevin, you, your entire state is working with. You know, we got to create the plan to implement. And you guys are here. So what's interesting is I see you guys, you've moved out here in this column, and it's a question, have we done all of these other pieces? But in the end, you've got sick care, health care, and payment coming under one umbrella, and this is how we gotta get there. This right here is the, essentially the vehicle of how we're gonna move. It takes this concept of population and health that's so vague and turns it into bite-sized operational pieces that hospitals can engage around. I, I just have a couple of the slides, you know, here's efficient, how do we define efficient, appropriate patient volumes, revenue cycle practices, expenses managed aggressively, have high quality, be able to compete with all the other hospitals around on your quality scores, your HCAPs, core measures, primary care alignment. Understand that just because you employ a primary care physician does not mean they're aligned. And just because they're independent does not mean they're not aligned. I look at your, the relationship with a primary care using Stephen Covey's rules of, of dependence, or dependent, your five-year-old, independent, your 18-year-old, interdependent, your 26-year-old. I don't know what that 26-year-old relationship looks like, but it's got to be better than the 18 relationship. <laughs> so, so when we talk about that, we've got to think about a, a, aligning primary care contractually, functionally, and through governance. CIN, so you guys have promoted a CIN in, in, in with your four hospitals. So great opportunities, but aligning with your primary care. If I walk out here with you, nothing else, the importance of primary care, I hope you understand. Rationalize your service area. Look for these interdependent relations, that 26 year relationship, through function, governance, and contracts with developing systems. Great opportunity for us all. Look at some of the self, your own self-funded employer plan. Look, sure, are we managing the risk of our own employees? Are we doing things to get them better with claims analysis and those types of things? Great opportunity. Participate in the fee-for-service and quality. And again, so we went right down through here. And um, uh, population health strategies, patient-centered medical home. Are we level three patient-centered medical homes? Are we extracting value through all the wellness <laughs> and all of that, getting paid for all that? Huge opportunity for us. Um, claims analysis capabilities. Um, you know, where are we in understanding the claims? You guys are in an ACO. In our individual hospitals, do we understand where our patients are, are utilizing healthcare services? <laughs> And then, you know, so ultimately, I look at this thing, again, as, as the coming together of sick care, health care, payment. But over time, <laughs> over probably a six-year period, an eight-year period of time, 
but that we've got to start moving. And, and you know, so, so in phase one, we ought to go through and check every single one of these boxes to make sure we've done it. Because you and in Vermont have advanced beyond, you've really got to start thinking about this, what's in this category, because you're moving it. But, but, but you know, essentially, in the end, this is where it's going. It has to go that way. <clears throat> Providers have to take that residual claim on health to and truly engage them in that environment, which means insurance function and provider function will come together. It's a three and a half trillion in dollar industry that, that the economic forces are so strong. This is the direction. This is where it's going. You know, force is the vector. Force and motion are going in this way. What we don't understand right now is the timing of it. Um, so, so again, in the end, my last comments, you know, we've lived in this fee-for-service world. The fee-for-service world has gotten us in trouble. It's gotten us too much. We've focused on more sick care rather than more health care. Um, I believe, as an accountant, our, our, um, how we pay and how we reflect payment is what's gotten so, much of us, so many of us in trouble here. We're measuring the wrong things. We're valuing the wrong things. And, and when we start fixing payment and then fix the reporting of our payment systems, we have a great opportunity to truly transform healthcare. Tra crossing this thing is going to have to be proactive. We are going to have to recognize that it's going to get, it's going to get worse before it gets better. And until we come out in that fourth column of population-based payment on a population-based infrastructure, we're going to struggle. And I think we have to be prepared for that. So, so. Uh, you know, some of these things, increase leadership awareness, improve operational efficiency, all these are key pieces that are going to help us get there. Apologize for going two minutes over, but um, uh, you know, thanks for listening and, and hope some of this made sense.
high rates of uninsured and underinsured, low education and health literacy levels and environmental challenges. Given this set of conditions as defined by the report, Vermont, like many states nearby and far away, has many communities with the characteristics we just defined. And the community health needs assessments that hospitals conduct under federal law to identify those factors and help develop the programs to address them are a huge part of the work hospitals do every day. So I know that the Green Mountain Care Board and many people in the room have seen and heard what's on this slide many times, but it's important. It's the story about how hospitals across Vermont play so many roles in the lives of our state and in our communities. Uh, we are, as a state, highly ranked across measures of access, quality, cost, and patient satisfaction. Like many hospitals across the country, like all, I would argue, we are employers and providers and community partners. Our work intersects with the work performed by so many other vital community organizations and institutions, from designated agencies and schools and the coalitions we are involved in to food pantries and other direct service providers, and all the other partners we need to help meet community need and address the challenges addressed by those needs assessments. In addition, hospitals, in concert with many others, are leading the work of health reform. I think it's important to point out, Vermont has long been a leader and at the forefront of health policy. We were among the first states to have guaranteed issue and community rating, and to make it illegal to deny someone insurance co in coverage because they have a pre-existing condition. And now, as we sit in this room, we're in a, we are well into a unique and compelling five-year agreement with the federal government to change how we deliver health care services in Vermont. And I think it's important sometimes that we step back from the weedy policy issues that often transpire in this room, and for good reasons, but to understand what the all-payer model is and why hospitals in Vermont are doing it, and even the small ones. It basically says this, that to bend the cost curve and to get better results for patients while we spend less doing it, we can't keep doing the same things the same way. And so we're not. We're putting primary care front and center. We're creating new incentives for quality and better outcomes. We're encouraging investments in partnerships and building clinical bridges to make sure that we're surrounding patients with the proper set of care and supports. This work is compelling because it makes sense. We prevent disease in the first place. We pay doctors to do more of what they love to do instead of paying them for the volume they need. We coordinate care more effectively, powered by the data and analytics available from the ACO and other sources. We coordinate care um, and more effectively, and we deploy community health teams so that more happens outside the walls than inside them. This is what the all-payer model means. Its framework is health promotion and prevention, and it is, as Eric pointed out, a statewide commitment to changing our focus from, wellness, from illness to wellness, from volume to value, and to a system of care that meets patients where they are. To do all of this, and to do it right, we need to make strategic investments. We have to align the work of the entire system, improve our facilities and modernize clinical equipment, fortify IT connections. To be clear, all of this work takes time, and it involves significant financial risk, especially for smaller hospitals. Hospitals need to perform all the functions I described earlier as caregivers, employers, and community builders because that's what we're expected to do every day. If hospitals are limited in their ability to earn the revenue needed to do these things and to simultaneously make these investments in health reform, the all-payer model will not be as successful and our goals will be jeopardized. Similarly, if Medicaid rates are cut or dish payments are further reduced, hospitals' ability to continue this transformational work is also threatened. And I think it's important to say, too, that as much as I personally believe in the power of the all-payer model um, and the power of policy and collaboration to move the needle in health care and reform, we all need to recognize that rural hospitals are taking a big leap to absorb the financial risk that's involved in this model, which is placed squarely on hospitals. Um, okay, so to orient you to this chart, getting a little bit Vermont specific here, the green bars represent national operating margins 
for hospitals in rural areas as reported to the American Hospital Association in 2013. So the data is a little behind and we're actually working with them to get some updated figures. But a major takeaway from this is that more than half of rural hospitals in the United States have an operating margin less than 3%. In the blue box, you see the fiscal year 18 operating margins for hospitals here in Vermont, where the statistics show that 86% of hospitals have a margin less than 3%. It's also really important to note that margins are not profit for Vermont hospitals, which are nonprofit organizations, all of them. And that without healthy margins, it's hard to make investments and improvements, to borrow money, to meet bond obligations, to buy new equipment, to weather federal changes, respond to a disaster, sustain unexpected headwinds, the list goes on and on. So that leads into the challenges and pressures um, that, that we face. And this is another slide that uh, the Green Mountain Care Board and others hear a lot about when budget presentations take place. Uh, because these are the challenges our hospitals manage every day, and they manage all of them together. Any one of the items in this table could justify its own three-hour panel. Um, I would just call attention to two on the top of the slide, which are workforce and our aging population, two factors that make the provision of health care ever more challenging in our state. One of our small hospitals, for example, Northeastern Vermont Regional Hospital in the Kingdom, recently said that recruitment and retention of healthcare professionals at all levels represents a significant risk for the organization. That's something that's echoed across the hospital field here in our state. Meanwhile, eight Vermont hospitals that reported to us have spent approximately $21 million in a single year for the cost of traveling nurses alone. Physicians, PAs, therapists of all types, home care providers, LNAs, even infotech people and admin people are challenging for pos positions for hospitals to fill, and that applies to organizations both large and small. So this is a, a slide I took from the American Hospital Association, which essentially depicts the same set of challenges named in the last slide. Um, but in a way that I thought was really interesting because it shows them based on three categories. Persistent problems that we've been managing for a long time like geographic isolation and aging infrastructure to recent problems like a growing mental health crisis and the skyrocketing cost of specialty drugs and then emergent and current problems and, and issues like the opioid epidemic and the need to protect our hospitals and patients against cybercrime and violations of privacy. So just a few things that are on hospitals' plates every day, along with all of the other care providers we work with. So Eric touched on some of the closed rural hospitals. Um, this is a map actually from Stroudwater um, that shows 101 rural hospitals have closed since 2010, apparently 102. One, one closed last week in Tennessee. <laughs> uh, one closed last week in Tennessee. Um, I have a list of New England hospitals if anyone's interested, but it's three in Maine, one in New York, and one in Massachusetts. You'll notice on the map that you're looking at on the slide that the highest rate of rural closures is concentrated very heavily in the south and in Texas. Um, a couple correlations there. One is that this region has not expanded Medicaid largely. And we also know that these states, for various reasons, tend to sit at the lower end of the access, quality, and affordability rankings. So this is the big slide, I think, um, uh, in a lot of ways, because I think it shows that the American Hospital Association's recommendations to manage the rural challenges we face across America um, line up so very well with the goals that we have embedded in the all-payer model. They suggest considering and adopting new payment models in concert with the Center for Medicare and Medicaid Innovation. We've done that in signing the APM. And just last week, a delegation, including our governor, went down to Washington, D.C. to meet with the CMMI team for what I understand was a very productive update. The AHA also suggests addressing the social determinants of health in a coordinated and deliberate way, which is a big piece of our reform model, along with primary care and prevention. And the experts that studied the most effective strategies and the most promising practices also said that employing telemedicine more routinely will reach people across difficult geographic boundaries. We've known this for a long time, but the all-payer model makes telemedicine easier because the lack of reimbursement for, cert for those services in a fee-for-service system creates obstacles that have prevented the widespread adoption of telemedicine. 
It's also important to name some of the barriers that exist to achieving our grand vision of a health system that works for all Vermonters and is affordable, high quality, and patient-centered. First, the all-payer model, as you'll remember from the early stages of its development, is provider-led and voluntary. Almost all of Vermont's hospitals are in so far for at least one payer program. But the risks are significant and the challenges are many. So not every hospital can be in right away, or maybe at all, given their unique circumstances and financial situations. We also need to remind ourselves that the all-payer model is Vermont's primary chosen health policy direction. It is a written agreement with the federal government that holds us to real model milestones, ACO attribution, public health, and cost growth. With all of this underway, we think it's unwise to move in alternative policy directions, and especially not because we get impatient or because we see another shiny object. We need to give this program a chance to succeed. It is already showing results, as I think you'll hear a little bit from our next speaker, and I believe it will thrive if, if we do not expect results to materialize overnight or if we don't take our focus away from this effort. And of course, I'll say again that legislative and regulatory cuts and arbitrary financial limits are highly problematic when we're trying to encourage small, fragile, rural hospitals to invest in a new payment model that can work for their organizations and for their communities. So to wrap up, I want to close with the um, Vermont Association of Hospitals overall recommendations and observations about the rural environment we're in um, and how to protect vital, Vermont's vital but clearly still vulnerable hospital system. I think we've covered all the territory on this slide, but just to sum up, hospitals face a number of persistent and emerging challenges that span operations, finances, public health, economics, and state and federal policy. Meanwhile, in Vermont, hospitals are doing the brave and bold work to improve health care and save money simultaneously while also doing the ultimate thing, which is to make the system work better for patients and create better outcomes. They, the hospitals need room to do that work. They operate in the most highly regulated environment in the nation, and it is also one of the most transparent environments in the nation, which is why we sit here today having this conversation. Regulation and lawmaking, in my view, should now be centered on achieving our state's reform and population health goals, and that includes fair and reasonable rates, as much as maintaining disproportionate share hospital dollars and other funds that help us maintain our operations and offset the cost of still growing uncompensated care. Um, it means also that together we appreciate the combination of challenges that has been described here today and that you're going to hear more about and that we keep this important dialogue moving. So I really appreciate the opportunity to be part of the panel and to have our perspective included and look forward to the rest of the remarks. Thank you so much. States ACO trying to uh, help uh, Vermont achieve the goals of the all-payer model. Um, and I appreciate the opportunity to be here today uh, to be part of this dialogue on this critical topic. Um, I have the added bonus of reconnecting with Eric Schell. Uh, the one gap in my bio that Robin left out is that for the last 20 years after leaving Dartmouth Hitchcock as a full-time employee, I've been a consultant uh, at Helms a Company, a company in New Hampshire that does mostly rural provider consulting in Maine, Vermont, and New Hampshire. And so Eric and I have crossed paths a few different times as we've worked with some of the critical access hospitals uh, and their challenges. Um, so what I'd like to do today is talk about how I think one care can fit into um, much of what Eric talked about in his presentation, but also talk about where we are in our evolution and some of the challenges uh, that, we, that we face currently. So, um, 2019 began our second performance year. Um, One Care, as Jeff said, was envisioned as a willing coalition of providers. <clears throat> this shows the breadth of providers 
that are committed to this reform effort. We have a broad range of participating providers and 12 of the 14 hospital service areas are involved for at least one of our core programs. We have a high level of rural hospital engagement, even though, as Jeff said, our model has the hospitals responsible for much of the financial risk uh, associated with working under a fixed budget. <clears throat> Recall that the all-payer model bargain at its macro level is that the willing providers would agree to manage the healthcare costs of an attributed population under a fixed budget while also working to improve quality. And in aggregate, and that's the all-payer part, across all payers in aggregate, that budget would be set at a lower growth rate than what had been incurred historically. <clears throat> and that is how the state locks in savings under the all-payer model. And it's up to the delivery system and largely with the hospitals bearing the risk to figure out how to be successful underneath those fixed budgets. One Care, as an ACO, <coughs> is the provider organization, <coughs> excuse me, I told you I was fighting a cold, uh, that was formed to help achieve this aim. It's important to have an ACO because the ACO allows providers that have referring relationships that work in multiple communities to be able to collaborate and work together and not run afoul of federal laws. It's hard to collaborate at an arm's length under the federal regulations in healthcare in our country. The federal government waives those limitations for providers participating in an ACO that agree to work together to manage cost and quality. That's why it's such an important vehicle uh, for the state. When we began this journey, everyone involved in the all-payer model agreed that to succeed, there needed to be investment in key resources and infrastructure to successfully transition from a fee-for-service system to one working on a global budget. Exactly as Eric talked about, we didn't really have a together system and we needed to invest to build uh, the fabric that we would be successful under uh, a global budget. And we identified three principal areas as needing investment. Primary care, care management and coordination, largely with nurses and social workers and others being involved. Um, uh, and we needed the community support services. And those are the three areas uh, that have been the priority for One Care in its population health investments. We, One Care has three sources of funds to help make that investment in the necessary infrastructure. The payers, the hospitals, and the federal government. And the federal government money is received through payments to Medicaid. The federal government, when we launched the all-pair model, made available a sizable amount of money to Vermont, over $200 million for the five years. But it was set up as funds that required matching from the state of Vermont, because this federal government wanted to make sure that the state of Vermont was equally committed and serious to helping with the transformation to build a system that it needed. Um, and that the money would be spent in the areas identified as important to achieve this transformation. This slide is representative of, of how the funds flow through One Care. It's sort of a Medicaid example, but under our contract with Medicaid, uh, One Care, the ACO, receives funds for all of the attributed lives that would be rendered to uh, providers that participate in the One Care communities. One Care, in turn, provides a front end fixed monthly payment to the hospitals, and that payment covers not only the expected cost of delivering the services within their organization, but also funds for some of the population health investments that I mentioned. They get the fixed uh, prospective payment for services, population health management care coordination. In addition, there are back end funds available to the participating hospitals through quality improvement, our value based incentive fund, and if they're successful at working in, uh, positively underneath the budget and generating shared savings, that would also come back to the hospital. Those back end funds are earned through performance. So I mentioned that. Um, uh, one of the areas that we identified as needing a, a investment to be successful under this population health model. So um, as we launched One Care, we learned that 
um, the federal support dollars that um, would be sought by the state of Vermont would be materially less than what we originally anticipated. But the need for the investments to transition the system to be successful under a fixed budget population health remained. And it was the hospitals, since they were gonna bear the economic risk, that stepped up and said, we will put up more funds for the transformation that's necessary for this to be successful. This slide is One Care's 2019 um, budget, so it's our expectations for investment in population health services. You can see it should be reflective of primary care as well as the community supports and services and care management. In 2019, the hospitals are gonna put up just over half of those funds. In prior years, the hospitals have put up well over half of the population health investments. I would say that the hospitals made this commitment at a time when perhaps they had greater economic strength than they enjoy today. One Care established a policy by our board and endorsed by the hospitals that we would essentially apply a Robin Hood principle in assessing the hospitals for their contribution to the necessary population health investments and the operations of the ACO. So we assess the larger hospitals at a greater proportion than we do the smaller hospitals. In addition, the critical access hospitals get a 50% discount uh, on the assessment methodology calculation. So we are trying to alleviate some of the burden on the most fragile rural hospitals. But despite that, it's still a lot of investment um, that is required. How have we done so far? Um, early signs are that we have uh, some, some good signs of accomplishment. We've certainly seen per, uh, provider participation growth, and that's a good thing. Um, I think we're up over 2,700 participating providers now. As I mentioned, 12 of the 14 HSAs uh, are involved. Um, we've seen improvements in wellness, improvements in care being received by folks who have chronic disease. We've started to see some impact on ER utilization, particularly some of the areas that have done some focused pilots. Um, we've seen some disease management success. So I think there's some very good positive signs, but it's early. How have we done economically? Well, this is one of the issues. We've not yet finalized our performance year one. Um, and we won't actually have final economic reconciliation with our payers until July. So um, we have some preliminary estimates that we think we're doing pretty well, but we're uncertain. And we're actually cautious. And the reason that we're cautious is that it has been a struggle for our payer partners, particularly the government payer partners, to be able to process claims correctly under the population health model and to be able to give accurate reporting to us that we can then share with our hospital members on how we're doing financially. And because we've had such turmoil in receiving accurate and consistent reports, particularly from Medicare, it makes it hard for the hospitals to feel really confident that the work that they're doing is in fact bearing fruit. We've not had a settlement yet so that they can see how have I done economically for the efforts that I've put in to this work. We're hopeful, we think it's gonna be good, but we don't have the ability to, to confidently report how we're doing as we go along. And I think that, creates anxiety and is daunting in the minds of some of the smaller uh, hospitals. This last slide talks about the aggregate risk that we as an ACO board bear that in turn our hospital participants bear. And I've highlighted for you the Medicare. The Medicare risk is by far the greatest amount of risk that the ACO and thus the hospitals bear. Part of that is because the expenditures for Medicare patients is much higher than it is for commercial and Medicaid. And part of it is because under our agreement with Medicare, we have to have the greatest amount of risk exposure. Eric talked about upside and downside ACOs. We have been a downside ACO as well. We've always had two-way risk, meaning if you do well, you beat your budget, you get to keep it. You do poorly, you blow through your budget, you're gonna have to pay. You're gonna have to bear the economic consequences of that. That's been part of the deal out of the gate, and the hospitals have stepped up and accepted uh, that part of, uh, of the responsibility. But this Medicare risk, when it comes down to some of the smaller hospitals, can represent one to two times their operating margin. And so you can imagine some of the trustees worried about solvency 
when they sit in finance committee meetings of the hospitals and say, should we participate with the one care Medicare um, model? It's a hard call for them. And we've not yet been able to show them the economic rewards because we haven't even reconciled performance year one yet. So it's just a hard spot. That's where we're at right now, uh, today, I think, for the hospitals. Eric showed a slide that I think had the Vermont admissions well below that of uh, the rest of the country. And there's a difference when you're in this ACL world between attainment and achievement. Most of the ACL models are trying to reward the providers for achievement, doing better, reducing cost, beating a cost target, beating trend. That's good. But when you start out at a place that has already had good attainment in terms of being a lower cost area, it's harder then to find the areas of waste and inefficiency to create improvement. But the hospitals have signed up for that challenge. But I would remind folks that particularly for Medicare and Medicaid, Vermont is not a high cost state. It's a low cost state. We've already attained lower cost, yet the ACL model is still challenging us and we accept that to try to still do even better underneath our targets. So um, what are some of the, one of the concerns that I have about Medicare, about half of our hospitals are in the Medicare program and the other half are not of our 12 participating communities. One of the reasons that's a problem is that part of the commitments that the all pair model makes to the federal government is the scale targets, that we would have a significant proportion of Vermonters in under the, the all pair model by 2022. Part of that is to guarantee that if we have a lot of Vermonters under the model, we've truly transformed the delivery system in Vermont. And there were two requirements that we have to meet. One is that 70% of all Vermonters will be in under the model by 2022. But the other one is that 90% of Medicare beneficiaries will be in the model. Well, when half of the hospitals say, we're not sure we can bear the risk of being Medicare, that creates a lot of problems for us. We're not gonna be able to meet that 90% target. And that's something that we have to try and work on. So I'll just, ch I'll just end with some of the challenges that I see that, that are facing us. Um, one is the willingness to continue to support the necessary community services. We already fund, one here already funds largely SASH and Blueprint. I already said, we're not in. Six communities are not in Medicare, but OneCare is continuing to fund those programs. We fund um, some of the support services that are needed to transition the community. Um, we're concerned when we hear discussions uh, looking to OneCare to fund even more at a time when our hospitals are facing uh, growing economic challenges. And a particular concern is, has the state of Vermont maximized the influx of out-of-state federal dollars to invest in this transformation rather than asking Vermonters to redeploy scarce Vermont dollars. And I hope that we are going after every possible federal dollar to invest in the areas that Vermont believes is important to invest in. Secondly is the Medicare risk mitigation. As I mentioned right now, that's a barrier to growth for us. We have to find a way to be able to get um, the smaller uh, hospitals to be able to be in the model. Um, Medicare may have a willingness to alter the risk model for smaller hospitals, but Medicare works on a two-year uh, lead time. So any changes that we'd be able to affect with them probably wouldn't become uh, effective until 2021. We likely need to do something sooner than that to try to gain greater participation um, in Medicare. Uh, and then lastly is the issue of reserves. We have to meet reserve requirements of the Greenmount Care Board and of the federal government. Um, we should make sure that we think broadly about the reserves for this risk and make sure that we're, we're not having it be the same risk as it being reserved multiple times by multiple entities. From the one care perspective, um, when we put up reserves, it's money from the hospitals or it's debt that we borrow. We recently, re we, we recently received a budget amendment from the Green Mountain Care Board that allowed us to lower our reserve requirement because of the reinsurance protection that we had procured. We're very appreciative of that. But we know that our Medicare reserve requirement is going to go up next year, and we've already borrowed money to meet that. Anything we could do to re reduce the reserve requirements on One Care Vermont would simply be savings for the hospitals or savings on debt expense uh, to uh, One Care as an ACO. I would say that Vermont has really accomplished
accomplished a lot in a relatively short period of time. As a consultant, I've worked throughout northern New England. Um, and I think Vermont is, is admired for what it's, uh, it's trying to accomplish. But it is a really big undertaking. And an undertaking that large, as we gain experience, it's natural that we're going to face challenges that we may not have anticipated when we began this journey. Vermont is not unique in its challenges, and you've heard that from our panelists today. All you have to do is look across the Connecticut River, where 26 hospitals exist, and now only three of those 26 New Hampshire hospitals are independent. The rest are, part, have, are either under an affiliation or establishing an affiliation with a large organization. And I'm not sure there are any independent hospitals remaining in the state of Maine. So um, we all need, I think, to be involved and be part of the solution. As Eric said, it's everyone that's going to make this transition and the all-payer model successful. So it's payers, providers, legislators, regulators, and the public all working together for continued success. These are challenging problems that we face, but not unique to us in Vermont. And I'm sure that through the collaboration uh, that has been done historically and that exists, we'll be able to find good solutions. And I appreciate the time today to speak with you. Thank you. same time, ten, eight, ten years ago. We're now the senior hospital CEOs in this state. So turnover in this state is probably about 50% of the, the last CEOs three years. in the last three years. That's, that's a factor as we look at rural health care as a turnover of, uh, of CEOs. Um, you've heard a lot of the high level challenges, um, and I'll just summarize very quickly. Uh, rural demographics. We've got an aging population, we have out-migration, declining birth rates, uh, poverty, homelessness, uh, substance abuse, opioids, heroin, alcohol, mental health. Uh, Wyndham County, you probably all saw, is listed as one of the least healthier uh, uh, counties in the state of, uh, uh, of Vermont. And we struggle with all of these issues with demographics. Um, hospital specific in a rural environment, um, not just Brattleboro, but for all the hospitals, We've got issues of retention and recruitment of both clinicians and staff, uh, which has led to a very significant uh, use of temporary labor. Um, that's contracted nurses. Um, last year, when we went in front of Green Mountain Care Board, we had about 11 uh, contracted nurses on our, um, on our, uh, uh, at our hospital. I think, uh, Tom Huebner, you had probably 20, 30. Uh, yeah, it's a real challenge for us, and we're paying double. Uh, for our contracted nurses as we do for our own staff. It's a real major problem. Um, clinician retirements, I mentioned CEO retirements. We've had an onslaught of clinician retirements. Um, in Brattleboro alone, we've had, uh, over the last uh, two years, we had three of our primary care physicians who had come to the hospital um, and to Brattleboro um, in the uh, 70s and 80s, opened up a practice, hung up a shingle. Dr. Tortolani, Bersnahan, and Chesney. 6,000 patients. They were, these docs retired six months' notice. Where do those 6,000 6, patients go when it's difficult to recruit uh, new physicians to an area? Real challenge for us in terms of, as you look at the age of the, not just our age, but the age of the physicians um, in, our, in our areas. Migration to the employment model. When I came to Brattleboro 
in uh, uh, nine uh, years ago, the majority of the medical staff was private, independent medical staff. But as you again see these retirements happening, who else, who's going to come now to your community and set up a shingle and go into business? It costs $40,000 alone to have electronic medical records. And Medicare, if you don't, will pay you less as a private doc if you don't uh, have an electronic medical record. So it puts an extra burden on the hospital now to employ physicians and clinicians. And in Brattleboro, as I mentioned, we probably had about eight physicians that were employed when I came. We're now up to 55 clinicians because we have to provide access to primary care and, and medical care in the market. And who else will do it? It has to be the hospital. Um, we also are focused on uh, Medicare designations. Um, there are several designations Medicare gives hospitals. In this state, um, half of the hospitals are determined as critical access hospitals. Um, you also have hospitals, such as Tom's Hospital in, in Bennington, that is a sole community hospital. They get preferential um, uh, rate structures from Medicare, cost plus, um, as opposed to a DR, pure DRG reimbursement for a diagnosis code. For Attleboro, we're, we're the only hospital that's um, listed as a Medicare-dependent uh, uh, hospital. Um, and the problem with that is that is the least stable designation under Medicare um, uh, by the feds. In every couple of years, there's a move not to, or to uh, eliminate the MDH designation. And that to us is about $4 million, um, substantial dollars. So we've always got to be conscious of how are we going to maintain our preferential status under Medicare? Because if, if Medicare decides to have a diminution of its payments to critical access hospitals, or to sole community hospitals, or to MD, MDH, that's going to put added pressure on us. It's substantial money, and we don't really talk about it a lot, but it brings substantial money to our hospitals in this state. Um, regulatory requirements. Um, not just for C uh, 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 Centers for Medicare, um, and licensing and protection, but also Green Mountain Care Board puts another layer of regulatory apparatus that we have to respond to. And in a small hospital like Brattleboro or Dan's Hospital at Gifford, it costs us money to respond to the regulations, to file our budgets every year. And we don't have departments uh, that do this. It's myself, it's my CFO working together with our leadership at the hospital. So that's an additional pressure that's on the hospitals. IT and technology. Um, we we uh, migrated onto a uh, Cerner platform. We had eight different um, IT platforms throughout the hospital, throughout the departments, whether it was OD or, um, uh, or the uh, uh, med surge or uh, uh, the ER. We had to get to one platform. That cost us several million dollars. And almost every hospital in this state is going through that transition. Those are huge costs. Um, a couple of years ago, when uh, Algo Bay was still um, uh, uh, chair, uh, Kevin's predecessor, uh, the Green Mountain Care Board, we went into our budget um, reviews and he asked, his first question was, what's that blue H going to mean to you moving forward? Because the blue H has to change. We have to move from just addressing the medical needs in our community to addressing the social determinants in our communities. That is a huge shift for us. Because if we don't do it, who's going to do it? Is it the Green Mountain Care Board? Is it the state? No. It rests on the hot, your local hospital is the agency that's going to be a convener of other community agencies to address the social uh, determinants of health in their communities, <coughs> working with the medical staffs. That's another huge change um, for hospitals um, in rural areas. So let me talk a little bit about um, some of the specific responses we've had um, uh, at BMH. Um, one is we've got to drive to do different models and new models of care. So the first is uh, development of a progressive care unit and post-surgical units. Um, probably about five, uh, four or five years ago, we had a typical medical surgical unit. We also had a typical five-bed ICU, intensive care unit. We started looking at who was in that um, ICU unit. Probably one patient um, out of probably maybe the three patients in that ICU were truly defined as critical care patients. 
But we had a staff, every patient, that went into that unit as if they were in ICU level of care. And that's a two to one ratio. Very expensive. Let alone trying to find ICU nurses in a very highly competitive market, which, is, which we find ourselves in Brownsboro. We've got Massachusetts and we've got um, New Hampshire right across the uh, uh, Connecticut River. So what we decided to do is create a uh, progressive care unit. We do not have a separate ICU CCU any longer, but we have to provide that le level of care through our organization. So we developed a critical care float pool that will attend to uh, intensive level of care patients, not just in the med surge unit, but in the ER, but OB, if we have a, a, a mom baby crashing in the OB unit, or elsewhere within the hospital. So you get to start thinking a little bit differently about how you deliver care on the med surge or an ICU. Um, we also um, brought on scribes um, to help the physicians and the clinicians um, so that they don't have to be tied to their laptop um, looking at their laptop taking notes. They can give that patient in an exam room, in an ambulatory setting, eye-to-eye, uh, face-to-face conversations. Um, that's a recruitment and retention issue for us uh, with our medical staff. Uh, Post-acute team. We have physicians and nurse practitioners serving the three nursing homes that we, uh, um, that we have in Brattleboro. Um, and that substantially reduced uh, the readmissions that I think Eric talked about to back to the hospitals. Telemedicine, uh, care coordinators who, um, who have been funded in part through the ACO. Um, one of the things we um, added this year was a psychiatric nurse practitioner in our emergency department. Are we getting reimbursed for that? Absolutely not. I asked Al, I asked the DMH for more money, now that didn't happen because of budgetary constraints. But we have to do that because of what we've seen as a change in our emergency room population and the challenges there. The last piece is dental care. It's kind of like, it's kind of like the uh, dark, dirty secret in, in Vermont, because I see these stats that show you know, the dent number of dentists per, um, per thousand population. The problem is, how many of those dentists have open panels for Medicaid for adults? How many do you think? Not many, right? The hospital said, we've got a problem here. So we've partnered now with United Way, and we're opening up a dental center. The hospital is committing the space, the equipment, um, and we're hiring the dentist. And United Way, in partnership with United Way, who is actually going to be employing the office staff um, to serve the adult Medicaid needs and, pay, and for folks that don't have insurance uh, or dental insurance. Um, that's what the pressure adds more pressure. But you know what? We have to do it because there will, there's no one else that's going to step in that role of the hospital to address those needs. And those needs in terms of dental uh, care and those of all of us in the hospital know that those patients end up in our emergency room with abscesses, horrible situations of mouth infections, et cetera. We've got to, we've, we've got to uh, because no one else is going to do it, we've got to address that need. Um, Tom uh, D has a great program. We went to visit him a couple of months ago in uh, Bennington. So they've addressed it in Bennington. We're addressing it in Brattleboro. But I think uh, more pressure will be on the hospitals to address that need as well. Uh, Jeff mentioned workforce development, huge challenges for us. <coughs> Even though we're, in, we're, we're close to other population centers, we're competing uh, for um, scarce resources. Those scarce resources being physicians, being nurses, being technologists. Um, so what we've done at, at, at Brattleboro is we've got to start looking at how do we control that pipeline of, of the workforce. So we've worked very closely um, with um, CCV. Uh, Joyce uh, Judy, uh, our president there, and I sat down a couple of years ago to create a medical assistant program. We now are doing an RN residency for new grads. We're going to hire new grads above what we need to staff the hospital so that we have that level of, as we have nurses turnover, that we can have those new nurses come in as, our, as, as residents and after a year be able to uh, uh, work in our units. Environmental services aides. Something as simple as a housekeeper. If you try to go out and hire a housekeeper, that's a pretty difficult position. So we work with Department of Labor, we work with CCV on uh, a program, a training program 
for environmental services aids in collaboration with the educational institutions. And now we're working with VTC for an LPN and an LNA, which is a LNA is a licensed uh, nurse assistant. So we've got a partner with, um, with um, state agencies, uh, with the educational institutions um, to address this major problem that we have in this state for workforce uh, uh, development. The other uh, area is associate providers. Um, we would really be in a very difficult situation in Brattleboro um, if we didn't um, uh, expand our roles of uh, nurse practitioners, physician assistants, and midwives. There's not enough MDs or DOs uh, to be had, uh, especially on the primary care front. So we really focus hard um, on the recruitment and retention of our associate providers. And finally, we've been uh, pretty lucky in um, uh, utilizing, working with this state in bringing in Canadian physicians. And these are mostly Canadian physicians that have attended U.S. residencies. Uh, and we're providing them with the H-1B and J-1 uh, visas. And despite all the things with Trump and, you know, uh, reducing the number of visas, we have found that uh, this is, uh, has been a, a very good avenue for, for recruitment is the Canadian uh, physicians who want to stay in the States after doing their residencies. Um, <clears throat> Number one responsibility for us in Brattleboro, like most hospitals, is about access to care. That's what we're here for, is access to care for our communities. But you know what? We can't be everything to everybody. That has to change. But how do you get to that point of um, caring for that community when you know as a small hospital you can't provide all those services? So you've got to provide those pathways. You've got to provide those partnerships to, ha to have those services available to your community. And that's what we're doing um, with Mike Halstead and, and uh, Springfield um, in terms of helping in terms of the OBs. In terms of um, Brattleboro, other areas, we've developed, we had a strategic partnership that we created with Dartmouth uh, and more importantly with Cheshire. Medical Center in Keene, New Hampshire. It's about 35 minutes away. Um, to again, develop those partnerships, whether it's um, uh, continuing with oncology, radiation therapy, uh, vascular surgery, those kinds of things, cardiology. Um, so that's our role, I think, in, in the community that we, uh, for Brattleboro, that we find ourselves being able that to, to, if we don't have that services, being able to have those relationships and those collaborations and partnerships in which to uh, provide our community with those services. Um, we have no choice but to embrace health care reform. Our major payer, as I mentioned, or didn't mention, is, is Medicare. Miller Medicare dependent hospitals, 65% of our, really of our uh, patients, inpatients are, are Medicare recipients. I'm really nervous, and so is the board, that every year our designation is on the block. Uh, luckily, we have Peter Welch in Washington that every year we can con count on him, excuse me, count on him to get a coalition of uh, congressmen um, uh, to um, re, uh, reinstitute uh, this program. And we got it reinstituted, Peter got it reinstituted for um, uh, uh, five years ago. And that was, um, well, for five years, that was about two or three years. But you know what? At the end of that five years, where are we going to be? We're still going to try to, try to, try to um, maintain that. But that's kind of a losing battle with what goes on in Washington these days. So our board said, we've got to be all in to the ACO. We're, we're there because we're not so sure with all the uncertainty in Washington about our number one payer, where that number one payer is going to be in terms of uh, continuing our Medicare dependent hospital status. So we were one of the first um, uh, hospitals that jumped in right off the bat to all three programs. Uh, and we continue that, and it's been a great partnership for us. We're waiting to see how the financials work out. Um, uh, uh, um, when Kevin gets, gets us all the numbers. But the other piece, too, is, is philosophically, uh, where Brattleboro is at and where our board is at, is that we believe um, in, the, in, in making that migration away from fee-for-service uh, to risk-based contracts. Um, and, and to population health. And we've been um, very, very aggressive in, in funding um, uh, uh, our community health team. Uh, we fund ourselves, it's not coming through the ACO or the blueprint, a vulnerable population nurse, a nurse who's actually we place in the homeless shelter 
uh, working with Groundworks is an uh, organization that um, works with the homeless population. Uh, Jill Bowenberry has been an architect of Rise of Vermont. We're all into Rise of Vermont, and that is part of the uh, ACO now. Care coordination, every one of our primary care practices, and now surgical practices, orthopedics, has an RN care coordinator. Um, we don't get paid for all of that um, or reimbursed for that, but it's the right thing to do as we look at making that change to population health as opposed to um, uh, being paid for medical services. Um, and as I mentioned, the continued uncertainty of, of our, our designation uh, continues to drive us to uh, embrace health care reform. And then finally, um, continued focus, ending focus on expenses. We're part of um, a group purchasing organization uh, through NIA, which is New England Alliance for Health, which is a Dartmouth affiliate uh, program of hospitals. I think we have probably 12 hospitals there. Um, we are constantly looking at how we can slim down our management structure and consolidate our management, um, not to affect anything that goes on at the bedside or in the practices. And then um, always looking at our utilization of labor, whether it's uh, I, uh, OT, um, overtime, placement physician, uh, physicians, and really a uh, consistent effort for cross-training of our staff. That's it. So good morning. My name is Dan Bennett. I'm the CEO at Gifford Healthcare and Gifford uh, Medical Center. Um, I'm going to pivot a little bit. Um, a lot of the themes that um, you've heard already are um, consistent with, with Gifford as well, but I want to talk a little bit um, about um, our mission-driven uh, focus at, at Gifford. Um, we are a uh, mission-driven organization that uh, strives to, to meet the needs of our community. Uh, we're here to uh, serve people from central Vermont, new mothers, young families, students, seniors, with high quality affordable health care in the rural communities uh, that we serve. Um, we uh, believe in promoting the well-being of, uh, of everyone of all ages uh, throughout, our, throughout our service area. For us, um, success really will be defined about whether we're able to continue to work in a way that allows us to respond to what these needs are in our community. If we can continue to do that, uh, we think that is going to uh, make us successful and it's going to make our communities more successful. Um, I want to give a, um, Steve talked a lot about partnering and I think I, on my notes here I have partnering written about 12 different times. So I'm going to uh, just start out with giving an example of, um, of how we partner. Um, some of you may know the, uh, the, the village, uh, the, the community of uh, Chelsea, of the map that uh, Jeff showed before. Um, uh, Gifford uh, in our area is right smack dab in the middle of the state. Um, what the map doesn't show is the, t uh, the, 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 t the topography of the state and uh, all those uh, different mountains and valleys that are in there. Um, Randolph is the center of where we serve, but uh, we serve a number of other communities, and uh, most of those are separated by uh, mountains and are in the valleys. Um, Chelsea is one of those communities. It's two mountain peaks uh, to the north of uh, northeast of of Randolph. Uh, it is a um, traditionally been a farming community, um, and uh, like uh, much of our area, has an older population, uh, and obviously is a rural population. Um, in that community, there is a partnership uh, that is uh, made up of um, what is uh, a, a nonprofit organization called the Chelsea Health Center Board. They own and maintain a, a facility. Uh, within that facility, Gifford Healthcare, our, our federally qualified health center, uh, maintains a primary care practice. Uh, we also uh, work very closely in that practice with the Clara Martin Center, which is the designated agency in our area, and they provide mental health services in that same facility. We also work uh, very closely with another nonprofit uh, that is called Health Hub, and they provide mobile uh, dental services, and their mobile services uh, um, are at the Chelsea uh, Health Center as well. And then finally, 
Uh, in that facility, uh, there's also a private uh, pharmacy called the Medicine Shop uh, that has uh, offers uh, uh, pharmacy services there in that community. Um, that is the kind of partnering, that is the kind of grassroots organizations that exist in our rural communities. Uh, they are the heartbeat of the communities, and in a community like Chelsea, if we were not able to provide all of those services and be right there for them, um, that would impact whether people are able to live in that community when they age, uh, how well they're able to live in those communities, um, and their, their health ultimately. Uh, I mentioned all the, uh, the mountains. Uh, transportation is an issue. And uh, it is a, uh, would, would be difficult for someone for, from uh, the Chelsea area to travel over to Randolph, to travel uh, north to um, the Barry Montpelier area or down to the Lebanon area for services. So having those services in that area are uh, very important. So Gifford has a uh, unique structure. Uh, back in 2014, um, uh, really taking advantage of what has been the philosophy long term uh, at Gifford, uh, that of uh, providing primary care and, pri and primary prevention services for our communities, uh, Gifford made the step of establishing a federally qualified health center. Uh, that federally qualified health center, Gifford Healthcare, is the parent organization for uh, all the other services uh, at Gifford. A federally qualified health center is uh, a primary care uh, organization. So Gifford now has at the top of its organizational structure primary care, which is where we think it ought to be, which is uh, I think what uh, from the comments from all of the others um, on this panel, uh, where they think primary care ought to be. It ought to be the leading force uh, in our healthcare organizations. Uh, that is imprinted on our, on our structure, in our governance uh, structure. Uh, without that FQHC, it would be very difficult for us to provide uh, services in some of these smaller communities like Chelsea, uh, like Rochester. Um, and uh, we would uh, realistically only be able to uh, provide those services in the metropolitan areas like Randolph. Um, so um, uh, we do have um, a strength in that structure. We do think it is the right structure uh, for our community. Uh, and uh, hearkening on uh, what I thought were encouraging uh, comments from uh, Eric about uh, the value of primary care in this, uh, in this um, healthcare reform environment that we're in, uh, we feel that we are well positioned uh, to be strong in that healthcare uh, reform environment. However, um, part of the, the purpose of this panel is to talk about challenges, so I want to talk to you about um, um, why that is challenging, even for an organization like Gifford uh, that does have primary care at the top of its organization. The, Devo the, the Vermont Department of Health uh, in 2016 did a uh, physician census report uh, where they looked at a number of different things um, and uh, um, uh, with the physicians in the state of Vermont. One of the uh, stats that came out of that is that in seven of the 14 counties in Vermont, at least 39% of the primary care physicians were over at the age of, over the age of 60. Um, so let me give you a little um, uh, glimpse as to what that looks like at Gifford. At Gifford, when we look at the entirety of our physicians in primary care, and that includes family medicine, internal medicine, pediatrics, OBGYN, psychiatry, and addiction medicine, 56% uh, of our physicians are over the age of 60. However, if you peel that back a little bit more and look at just family medicine and, and internal medicine physicians who are practicing outpatient care in our community, 80% of those physicians are over the age of 60. If I had sat here last summer and talked to you about that, it would have been 100%. Um, this is the reality on the ground uh, in rural Vermont and in rural America. Um, we've, you've heard panelist after panelist here today, and if you read any of the literature, how important primary care is to the future of healthcare in Vermont uh, and to the future of healthcare in America. Uh, in the rural communities in particular, um, it's dire, and we need to put resources uh, behind uh, investing uh, in our rural communities and making sure that we can have those primary care providers 
uh, those primary care physicians who can uh, care for their community members. Uh, like Steve, we've done a number of different things to, um, to try to make that situation uh, better. We uh, have been very successful in bringing in a number of talented uh, nurse practitioners and physician assistants, certified nurse midwives um, throughout our organization, and that has been uh, very helpful in our being able to meet the needs of the community. But we also need to have uh, physicians in those communities. Um, the, we take, uh, and our, our providers take advantage um, of uh, Vermont's AHEC program, which provides uh, loan reimbursement. Uh, for, uh, for primary care providers. Uh, however, those resources need to be expanded and those opportunities need to be expanded. We need to make Vermont uh, a place where uh, primary care physicians and other providers uh, want to be practicing and where it's attractive and affordable for them uh, to, be, um, to be practicing. Steve talked a lot about partnering and I wanna uh, talk a little bit more about that as well. Um, and I also want to talk about uh, balance in, uh, in, in terms of services that are provided. Um, uh, as I noted before, transportation can be a big issue in rural communities, whether that's because of an aging population or whether it uh, is because of uh, those mountains that we all, we all love and uh, love to enjoy from a recreation standpoint, not to mention uh, to look at, but they're awfully hard to travel over. Um, so it's important that there's a balance of services in these communities. Uh, it's, not a, it's not enough just to be able to provide primary care services. We need to be able to provide uh, the, the core specialty and surgical services in our communities as well. Again, it's difficult um, for people to travel for those uh, services, uh, particularly for the, for the older population and uh, for the population um, uh, that does not have the financial means uh, to travel. So we need to also uh, invest in uh, those core services, whether that's general surgery, orthopedic surgery, um, whether it's cardiology services, having those services available in these small communities. Um, we um, continue to look for, for ways to do that. At Gifford, we've partnered with larger organizations, whether that's Dartmouth-Hitchcock, whether that's Central Vermont Medical Center, the, the UVM uh, Health Network. Um, to provide services in our community like orthopedics, like cardiology, uh, like pathology, oncology services, staffing our tumor board. Um, these services that, uh, that we need to make our, our healthcare community uh, vital. Gifford uh, has um, made the choice to participate uh, in, with, with One Care Vermont in the all payer model. Uh, we are participating in the Medicaid program only at this point. Uh, we are one of those uh, community hospitals that is really struggling with uh, how and whether we'll be able to uh, jump into uh, the next step of participating with Medicare. Um, uh, I think uh, when Kevin was talking, he said that um, that risk, the financial risk of uh, the Medicare uh, uh, population, that financial risk that's represented with going into the all payer model for that can represent uh, one to two times uh, small hospitals uh, operating margin. Um, that's if you're in the black. Uh, if you're in the red, it's a lot worse than that. And so uh, we need to have the stability in our uh, small hospitals to be able to participate in this. We need to have creative ways uh, if we're going to be um, uh, participating in this. Um, I'm encouraged by uh, the conversations I've been able to have with uh, Kevin around this. However, more work needs to be done to make it so that uh, small hospitals can, um, can be more of a player in, um, in the healthcare reform uh, efforts. We think that um, uh, we've been uh, doing all of, the, uh, all of the work, providing the types of services that are consistent with what is uh, happening with healthcare reform here in Vermont. As I noted, Gifford has a long uh, tradition of providing primary care and uh, preventive health uh, services in the community. We also have a long history of uh, community health and community outreach programs. And that's something that we've, em that we've really emphasized uh, uh, since I've been here as well, the last two and a half years. Um, we now have a new partner uh, in that, uh, who's gonna help us to uh, expand upon those community outreach services that we provide. That's Rise Vermont, which, uh, which Steve noted. Um, this is one of the uh, real assets that 
uh, our small communities can get from participation in the all-payer model, and it's something that uh, Gifford is going to uh, be a part of uh, going forward as well. And again, these are things that we've been doing, uh, but now we have uh, some other resources to, to bring to bear, and uh, I think this is what um, we need to continue to do in Vermont, is to find ways to support healthcare that is provided in these rural communities. We know our communities. We are um, mission-based. We are trying to uh, figure out what the needs are in these communities and provide uh, the services uh, that are required. Um, so um, I, I also just want to note um, uh, one of the things that uh, we've really had to focus on at Gifford is looking at our cost. Um, we have, uh, across our organization, uh, every employee has been focused on finding ways that we can be more efficient, that we can cut cost. We have seen uh, some uh, some pretty good results in the last uh, in the last year in that regard. Uh, but we also have to recognize that there's only so far we can go. You've heard a bit about workforce issues uh, here today. If you've, um, I'm sure that's not the first time you've heard of that. Uh, we can't go so far uh, as not uh, where we can no longer uh, invest uh, in our employees, where we can uh, have uh, competitive wages for them, where we can attract people to come to Vermont and come to the small communities uh, to work. Uh, we have to have investments in a well-rounded core of uh, community-based services uh, that can be provided in the rural communities. Um, so that is, uh, those are the things that we're focused on. Uh, that is the rural model that, um, that, that we think is successful and will be successful. Uh, as I noted at the beginning, I'll go back to it. Uh, for us, success is going to be measured on whether we're able to continue to meet the needs of our community. Uh, we look to do that uh, through uh, the services and the people that uh, we can provide uh, to those efforts, but we also look to do it um, in working with uh, the numerous partners that we have in our community and across the state. Uh, and that is uh, what we want to continue doing. So um, with that, I want to thank everybody for uh, the time today and for your attention. Great to have uh, the legislators and the Green Mountain Care Board interested in, um, in what we can do to improve rural health care in Vermont. So at this time we'll open it up to um, what we normally would do is the board first um, for questions or comments, but because we do have um, legislators in the room, um, I also want to open up this period um, to give them a good crack and ask them questions. So if a legislator has a question, if they could stand Susan will kind of act like Phil Donahue and run around with a mic um, to get over to you. In the meantime, I'll start it with uh, four questions. Well, okay, I'm old. <laughs> Hi, thank you so much all for coming. Um, I had a question for Mr. Shell, which was... Did you have um, yourself? Yes, a I'm Lucy Rogers, so I'm one of the state representatives on the Health Care Committee here in Vermont. Um, and I had a question for Mr. Shell, which was, I was wondering if you, I really appreciated you going through kind of the, the financial ways that um, the ACL model could be an opportunity to hospitals, and I was wondering if you could just revisit the clarification for why you saw it, this model specifically as a, um, an opportunity for rural hospitals compared to other hospitals. Um, and then combined with that in, the, I guess, the second part of the question, in Vermont, a lot of the leadership for our ACO has come from the larger hospitals, and I'm wondering if that's a trend throughout the country, or if that's a Vermont thing, and if it is a trend, why? <laughs> that is a lot. <laughs> so, I, I think as we start to move in, and so the primary care becomes that 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 revenue center um, of of that new of this new world. 
the, the rural hospitals are built around a primary care-based delivery system, which is the upside value. Um, we didn't build ourselves around the future fixed cost centers um, of, of the new payment world. So, so if we start thinking about that, that it's, it's an inherent value, it's a, it's a future economic value, that it's not necessarily here in terms of dollars and cents today. So, you know, so I, I do think that the, the rural hospitals have incredible value in this new world. With regard to the larger systems, um, so there's a couple different business models. Most of the ACOs are, you know, a majority of the ACOs are large system led. They have the dollars to invest and they're building. Mean, um, but there's also other, there's rural hospitals, um, the four critical access hospitals over in northern New Hampshire. They pull together four critical access hospitals into a system to get enough covered lives to get to at least 5,000 covered Medicare beneficiaries so that they could be an ACO. Um, they partnered with an organization called Caravan Health that has, uh, they, they work around you know, somewhere between 40 and 50 ACOs, all rural communities banding together um, to pool their lives to get to the 5,000 life threshold requirement for Medicare. Um, uh, they, they are now, because of the new risk criteria uh, on the ACOs under the Pathways to Success, are required. <laughs> Essentially, they're, they're, they're merging some of their ACOs together to be able to diversify that insurance risk. Um, the other, you know, the idea that the large, larger systems are taking the lead, that's, the, that's a majority right now. And, and, and I think it gets back to that imperative of coming together, right, coming together to, to address the, the, the primary functional imperatives of that new payment system, which are um, aggregating lives, to diversify insurance risk, to take that claim, to take that residual claim on health. To me, that's the most, one of the most important things we could say is that is provider organizations taking that residual claim on health is gonna be the, one of the first things that'll get us going towards a true healthcare system. And, and so the larger systems taking that lead, they have the resources and, and frankly, they're gonna be, they're all, you know, rural hospitals and larger systems are gonna be a part of it. To the extent they take the lead, it's, it's okay. They have the resources to do that at this point. So I, I just walked all around your question and I'm not sure if I answered it or not. There's a lot there that you said. Anyone? I would just like to comment. You know, the, the largest systems, UVM Health and Dartmouth, helped stand up the ACO to get it launched. And there were a lot of costs, Eric talked about that in his discussion about upfront costs to, to set it up and get it going. But we're evolving and we've, we have evolved uh, our organization on governance. So I'm interim, but my new successor when hired will be a full-time a devoted employee of One Care Vermont. I would welcome people to go onto our website and look at our board composition. We have a broad uh, diversity of providers on our board. We have to have 75% of our board be pro at least be providers. That's a Medicare requirement for a Medicare certified ACO. We have a diversity of providers and provider voices. And for most of the big decisions that we make uh, as an organization, we have a super majority requirement, meaning that two thirds of the board members have to vote uh, to obligate one care, which means that no one stakeholder or no sort of um, provider type can, uh, can rule or dominate the actions of one care. This is a collaboration, and so we want to make sure that decisions that we make and efforts that we undertake have the broader support of the provider community and aren't just representative of one or two stakeholders. So Eric, I'll throw out another question for you. Um, you heard that, that uh, Jeff mentioned that $21 million was spent on travel and nurses. Speak up. You can't hear you, Peter. Is it working? Yes. yes. Okay. Speak into it. So Eric, uh, one of the huge problems that we're facing in Vermont is our workforce shortage. Um, there's an analysis done by the Business Roundtable that shows that the next two years we need 3,900 new nurses. Um, we do a little bit better in Vermont on uh, primary care than the rest of the country, but as you know, we've got it flipped backwards in the U.S. with two times the specialist primary care where other countries have twice as many primary care providers as specialists. And so um, as Vermont is trying to figure out how do we address this workforce shortage when we have a declining population in the state and in the working age and everything, what have you seen around the country in your travels that would um, 
be something that we might be able to learn from as far as trying to address this huge problem for our state. So, so some of the best practices that I've seen, uh, there was a hospital in, in Minnesota around provider recruitment where uh, the CEO has an eight-year medical staff development plan where he looks out eight years at the potential, potential retirements and starts planning then, which puts him right into the high schools, the local high schools. So they start identifying the kids in schools that are interested in the biology, the sciences, and start having them round with physicians. Really great plan. He said, if I have to recruit for next year a doctor, it's a failure in my system. Um, around the, 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 the nurses and the, the technical providers, a lot of that, I see a lot of partnerships between um, healthcare systems and, and colleges, um, you know, um, where, where nurses are rounding in and they're, they're, they're doing their programs in, in, in the rural hospitals. And I see, so I see a lot of that activity. Um, you know, I, I hate to say this, but if we think back probably 12 to 14 years ago when we had this major pending nursing shortage, you know, it was interesting. Uh, you know, there were all, all the doomsday reports where we're going to be out of nurses in 10 years. And then what happened was the market worked where uh, wages went up. As wages went up, you know, it's the classic supply and demand as, we, as the, the RN rate, uh, rate, rates went higher and higher and higher, the, there was more substitution, but there was also more supply being offered. The more, the, the, the more demand, more people wanted to be interested because they could make a decent living being a nurse, and, and the schools opened up, and the market just kind of solved that over time. Um, so, you know, it gets back to this, this in, in my economics class, you know, the, 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 my employer does not set my rate, the market does. And I think the market's probably going to be speaking here in the very short term around some of these real nurse shortage challenges. Thank you, Question. Jess. Great. Um, I wanted to ask a question about scope of services. Um, Eric, you mentioned rationalizing the service network. And I heard from Dan and Steve about you know, the partnerships and appropriate service lines. Jeff, can you speak up? Yes. Okay. Okay. Um, so I'm asking about the scope of services. Uh, as we think, so the financial strains are real, right? We've got demographic challenges, payer mix challenges, workforce shortages, shifts from inpatient to outpatient, high fixed costs, hospitals closing all over the country. Uh, the reality is everybody wants, just like they want a school in their backyard and in their community, they want a hospital in, in their community, and they want a full-service hospital in their community. Um, and, but in this climate, I'm, I'm really questioning whether this is realistic. And so is rethinking the service set part of our path forward in the sense that many rural hospitals are offering a wide array of services? Should they be, should we think about right scoping, the right size and right scoping hospitals mm -hmm. Recognizing we have some trade-offs, economic you know, hospitals are the economic drivers in their communities. Lots of jobs. Uh, there's a vital need for emergency services in communities, particularly in rural areas where transportation is an obstacle. But I wonder what kind of uh, research is done in other areas and other in other states around what is the appropriate scope of services for a small rural hospital. The idea that are there services for which the volume is actually not sufficient for either financial efficiency, economies of scale, let me economies of scale, back to my economics class, um, financial sustainability, or frankly, meeting quality of care thresholds. If you're not, you've got low volume, are your providers doing enough of these services to meet a quality threshold? And plus, if you're not meeting your fixed costs, what's happening to the total cost of care of that service line? So my question is about appropriate scope of services in rural hospitals. So it, it, we're, Vermont, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna <laughs> to asterisk Vermont on this one, because when I go around and I help rural hospitals improve their performance, 90% of the time, my recommendations are finding out new services to offer the community, increasing market share for services currently offered, or getting paid better for what you do. And the reason why is that when you have 80% of your costs fixed, increasing, you, you, you add one more lab test, you get paid $12 for that lab test, you're variable costs of that lab test are $2. So you're dropping $10 to your bottom line to cover that 80% of your costs that are fixed. 
And so one of the lessons I give, and I give talks on this, of the economics of a rural hospital is create thousands and thousands of mini contribution lines, lab services, x-ray services, all the services. Doing more in a fee-for-service environment creates that contribution and to cover your fixed costs. And, and so that's the fee-for-service mindset that we get in, and that's why we are where we are. Uh, when we start talking about you know, you know, the Kaiser model, right? The Kaiser model says we're successful when our beds are empty. It's a very different equation. You know, I look at you know the four critical access hospitals in northern New Hampshire. Now, this is I, I, I haven't I don't know what's going on there now, but as they came together as one system, let's just say three of them right now are offering 24/7 general surgery. Do we really need three 24/7 general surgery programs? in a two county area in, in northern New Hampshire, or as they come together, they can start to, I like to use a rationalize, they can rationalize the services they're offering, recognizing that as we start, as we farther we go into these, these, these um, you know, accountable care payment types, we just don't have to have all the services to create many contribution margins. Payment is going to be fixed, a lot like it is here in Vermont, it gets back to the asterisk around Vermont. And then we can decide how to best rationalize services that are provided. But there are, there is a right size. I mean, it was at a two-bed hospital in um, uh, critical access hospital in East Tennessee. It's a two-bed critical access hospital. Um, you know, it goes anywhere from you know, Littleton, New Hampshire, where you have ninety million dollar net revenue critical access hospital. So there is, and the scope of services are going to vary really to pay, based on the population, the demographics, what can be supported. Here, again, Steve. Yeah. So I have a question for the audience: um, Who's responsible at the hospitals to define the scope of services at the hospital? I see one gentleman pointing to himself. Patient demand. <laughs> who? Patient no, who, demand. Who is responsible? Board. board. That's exactly right. It's the board of trustees, in our case it's the board of directors, who are members of our community. And a lot of our job at, as CEOs is to educate our boards as to what Eric is talking about, what Jeff has talked about, about how are we going to survive, and more importantly, what is that age going to look like? That's your board's response. How many board members are here? So we have a number of board members from hospitals. Yes. So that's your responsibility as board members of hospitals. And your CEO's responsibility is to educate and present the challenges that we face and what are some of those tough decisions that are going to have to be made. Like in the case of Springfield, not doing deliveries. When you get to 125 deliveries a year, that is very difficult. There's a hospital, Lakes Region Hospital in Laconia, 285 deliveries a year, our size in Brattleboro. That's how many we deliver in Brattleboro. They shut their OB down. Now there's some other factors because they weren't able to recruit and retain um, OBGYNs, but that is a very scary thought for any community. But those are some of the very difficult decisions that, that are out there to be made. It's not the Green Mountain Care Board that's going to make those determinations. It's going to be our local board of uh, trustees. Okay. Um, I have a question for uh, Can I just, uh, just, just real quick, I just want to, um, just to expand upon that a little bit. Um, I also think that it's um, uh, incumbent upon us to look for creative ways to do that. Um, uh, you know, I, I don't think we should be um, uh, duplicating or uh, providing services that are not appropriate for a small community. But there are there is a core of services that ought to be um, uh, that ought to be delivered in a local community uh, for all the reasons we've talked about uh, here today. Uh, but are there creative ways to do that so we're not duplicating? So that um, uh, you know, and I you know I can only point to what what I know. We we are working with Dartmouth Hitchcock on orthopedics. Orthopedics I would say is a core community service. We are collaborating with them on that service. We're doing the same thing with cardiology. So we are not uh, duplicating the number of people who are providing this service in a wider area. We're leveraging resources that are already there. Uh, we are um, uh, basically adding to the capacity of what uh, these physicians um, can provide. Those are the kind of 
uh, collaborations, the kind of partnering that I think we need to be focused on uh, as we're moving forward because resources are scarce, um, but the need is there. And the barriers to patients accessing services and having to travel uh, for services is great. And if there's, those services are not provided in local communities, the people who are gonna suffer are the older people and the people who don't have the means to travel. Uh, and uh, at the end of the day, our board of directors, uh, as Steve said, have um, the responsibility to look out for those people. Um, so that's, that's how we approach it. Sure. Yeah, I, I just just say something real quick. You know, my context is very interesting. One of my first trip to Alaska, I was 800 miles out in the Aleutians in Dutch Harbor. Anyone see the show, the the deadliest catch? It was a king uh, king crab fisherman. In that community of 3,000 people, they have um, 800 miles out in the Aleutians. They have 3,000 people. They have a clinic. It's a federally qualified health center. That's all they have for healthcare. When you're a female and, 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 and ready to, to deliver, you know, six weeks before, you, you go to Anchorage. And, and so my, my, the way I think about this is, is coming from that type of far extreme to you know, a hospital discontinuing delivery services 30 minutes outside of Bangor, Maine. Um, you know, it's very different and it really, <laughs> Alaska is very different, but, but you know, once we come over here, kind of deciding what makes best sense to keep the hospital open is the most important thing. And if we're losing a million and a half or $2 million on delivery, delivering 125 um, babies, it's a tough economic question. It's, a qu it's tough to maintain that. Uh, yeah, my question really goes around some of your uh, recommendations that you put in where you talked about you know, many of the rural healthcare providers have not yet considered the magnitude of the change or the required strategies. And, I want to set up a little bit about you know some of the things that have changed over the past couple of years, and then ask if you have any you know key strategies or you know some big movers because when we look at the past four years in Vermont, um, four years ago three of our hospitals were losing money at operating margin. Three years ago three hospitals were losing money at operating margin. The past two years it's jumped to eight and seven losing operating margin. And last year, all seven of the hospitals that lost operating margin also all missed their top line budget. So, you know, whether that was poor budgeting, whether it was patients, you know, moving to different places of care, you know, I'm just trying to say, how do we get to a situation where, you know, we can go to some of your recommendations, maybe on either the magnitude of change or the required strategies, because you know, Jeff put up the slide as well that in the 50 states, I think we have, you know, we have almost 60% of our hospitals losing money on the, of the 14 hospitals where you look at, you know, nationally in that category, it's like 35. So we are seeing the move. We're seeing, you know, our hospitals are beginning to financially struggle and it's not sustainable over the long term. And so, you know, what are the things that are going to help turn that around? Um, and whether you have any, you know, key strategies or, or things to help with that? Yeah, it was really in that, in that it was called the transition framework. Um, you know, we're still living in that fee-for-service environment right now uh, where, where, you know, the, we talked about the carbon monoxide of Medicare uh, uh, um, uh, you know, margin, and it's gone down to rural hospitals, with Curtiflex hospitals included, minus 6%. That's, you know, that's one of the reasons why we're seeing the losses. We're seeing costs go up, as this gentleman here explained. We're seeing volumes come down based on some of the things that we talked about. We're seeing price relative to cost coming down, and so we're, we're here where we are. It's, it's it's, it's everything in column one in that transition framework, you know, operating efficiency. Are we doing everything? You know, 60 to 70 percent of our rural volume drives right by a front door of our hospital. If we can keep five percentage points of that in our hospital, come have them come back to our hospital, either promoting our quality, getting out, being part of our community more, engaging our community, getting 5%, that's a 15% increase in volume. And remember those mini contribution margins? That's a whole lot of mini contribution margins to cover losses. Um, getting paid better. I can't tell you a Medicare cost report I haven't looked at whether 
there's 250, there's not 250 to 500 thousand dollars of pickup, just because we're not submitting our cost report accurately and getting paid for what we do appropriately. Uh, so it, it's right down that whole line of things, aligning with primary care, getting paid for wellness visits, getting paid. You know, are we in a rural health clinic? Should should we be in a rural health clinic? Uh, you know, all of these things is. I left uh, Rob on a list of all the best practices that we pulled together. It's eight pages, so I uh, probably don't want to get into that right now, but there's all kinds of things that we can do around, um, around you know, turning our own performance around. Chairman Lippert. Uh, yeah. Yes. Okay. This isn't going to reach all the way, oh, okay. so we have line coming over. Thank you. Um, I think this is part more of a comment than a question, but I feel like it's a challenge we need to uh, address. And that is, I think, uh, the communication, we need to communicate about the changes, the fundamental changes that have been discussed here today, the fundamental changes moving from fee-for-service to value-based payment, and the imperative of that is not being fully communicated. I believe, to our communities and, as you said, to your boards of directors, to legislators, to policymakers in the legislature, uh, and some policymakers, perhaps in the executive branch as well. And I think until we have, uh, until we stop second guessing the direction that is being outlined, uh, we will not be able to fundamentally move forward in the way that is required. Uh, add to that, uh, what, what Vermont has is a long-standing suspicion of, a long-standing and deep suspicion of big. And so one care uh, becomes a target and sets itself up as a target at times for hospitals taking quote, taking over physician practices rather than rescuing physician practices. We have, we have all kinds of swirling uh, dynamics at work here, uh, including the Green Mountain Care Board. Isn't it big, and why do we have it anyway? And why do we have to pay all the money to have it? Uh, so we, we have, we're doing this also in a federal setting where we're under attack, uh, where our committee has had to spend a ridiculous amount of time trying to fund Find, trying to forge protections for Vermonters to push back against the attacks on the Affordable Care Act, rather than being able to work proactively. So I think we need to recognize the, the, the deep challenge of communicating more effectively uh, with all the different constituent and stakeholder groups involved in the challenge that we're here to talk about today. And I think this has been a terrific conversation, but I think we need to, and I, I by myself sitting here over and over. Oh, I wish so-and-so were here. Oh, I wish so-and-so were here. Go, oh, well, maybe they're here, maybe they're not here. Uh, but it's, I think this is a fundamental, basic issue for us as we take on these challenges. Can I comment on that? Um, first of all, I just want to say I could not agree more with every single thing that Chairman Lippert just said. Um, it is really critical that we figure out effective and clear ways to turn this really compelling work into English that people can understand. Because it does get deep in the policy weeds very quickly, and it's complicated, and when you start getting into this, the mechanics of an ACO and the financial operations, you lose sight of the big picture, which is what part of what I was trying to, to paint. Um, I think we're getting better at it, but we need to continue to get better. Um, board member Jessica Holmes and I have been talking about trying to create a one-pager that literally puts this at like a fifth grade reading level. It makes it very clear exactly what we're trying to accomplish and how it's going to work and what the promise really represents. I also just wanted to comment very briefly on the notion of big. I certainly understand that that in Vermont, it's scary to think of big corporations and, and that uh, the health network seems to represent that. Just, just by way of comparison, as, as it was mentioned earlier, United Optum employs more physicians in this country than, than anyone else. Um, and there was a recent merger um, of two um, healthcare systems in the, in the West, um, Dignity Healthcare in California and Catholic Health Initiatives in Denver. Um, that system combined 
um, created um, a, a mega health system with $150 billion in revenue, 57,000 employees, 400 care sites across 12 states. That's big. Um, <laughs> And by comparison, what we have in Vermont is really quite tiny. And, and I only say that by way of saying also that, that, that size also brings economies of scale and it helps to achieve a lot of the goals that, that we're achieving here. Again, the goal is to create a healthcare system that works for Vermonters. Thank you. And then I'll go to Thank you all. I have a question about urgent care centers. Um, how do they fit into this or not? And are there any policies that you can think of that would be helpful around that issue? Oh, sorry. Uh, I'm Mari Cordes. I'm a registered nurse, and I'm a representative, a state representative, also on the House Health Care Committee. So, so I think, you know, I had an interesting observation a couple of years ago, I, um, and, and, it, and it's going to go right at the heart of the urgent care is cannibalizing the emergency room as a reason for not doing urgent care. I was at a, a rural hospital system in south southwest uh, Tennessee, larger community, about 30,000 people. They had all the fears, they had 16,000 ER visits, all the fears around, hey, if we open up this uh, urgent care, it's gonna cannibalize our emergency room, our revenue is gonna go down, we're gonna you know, kinda, you know, all the reasons. They opened up the urgent care, which is now seeing 9,000 patients a year, and the, uh, their ER volume only went down 4,000. So they net picked up significant patients that were leaving the community. So that's just one kind of lesson. I think today with the high deductible health plans that we talked about, you know, 60, what was it, 65% of small businesses have high deductible health plans. If our rural communities with hospitals aren't offering urgent care at a reduced price from the emergency room, we missed the boat. We have patients leaving, driving right by the front door of our hospitals, going 40 minutes to an urgent care where they're gonna pay 300 bucks out of pocket rather than paying, uh, you know, you know $1,200. And so, you know, one of my recommendations is if a rural community with a hospital does not have urgent care, if they start, they, they use the rural health clinic designation, they open up as a walk-in, but they expand their hours, and they really offer that service um, to the community. So I, I was just going to add to that. So first of all, from the one care perspective, we're agnostic, but providers that can help render good care, we welcome as participating providers in our network. But I think the bigger issue is, um, why, it, to me, it starts with, are people going to the ER, but they don't really need the services that an ER is set up to provide? And one of the reports that we generate at OneCare is, uh, for our hospitals, is emergency room visits that don't lead to admission. Because if that's a high number, that's an indication that people are coming to the ER and they're not as sick as you might expect them to be to go to the ER. A lot of times, and other things you can look at is, are they coming during the day or are they coming off hours? A lot of times, people show up at the ER because we don't have good primary care access. And they know they're sick and they know they need to see the doctor, but they can't be seen or the appointment is tomorrow morning or we can't see you until the end of the day, and they go to the ER. So while I'm fine with urgent care centers that may play need, I think what we really need to do is make sure we have good primary care access so people can see their providers for their needs. If they're really sick, we'll always have a 24-7 ER. If we're good at that, then I think to Eric's point, the question is, well then, is our urgent care centers then filling an important needed role in between good primary care access an emergency room, and if they are, then we should want them to exist in areas that can support them. And if they're not, and we've done away with that need, then we should take stock of that as well. Yeah, I, I should state that I um, I do have a concern about the freestanding, um, not hospital-based urgent care, uh, but the urgent care clinics that would not fall under the under state oversight. Joe? 
Hi, good morning. I'm Jill Brabo, the CEO of Northwestern Medical Center. And I want to actually comment on a couple things. So on urgent care, uh, we actually do have urgent care in our community. It's right next to our primary care, so it is really cool. Our, our um, access to primary care is critical. We've reduced our ED visits by 5,000, um, and we started about 30,000, so it's kind of a big chunk by having access to primary care, and our urgent care is adjacent to our primary care. So when they come in, oftentimes they don't have primary care access, and we can link them right up. So it's really about developing a, a system of care where the right door, they're getting into the right door, or they're getting transferred to the right door. So it's a, an integrated system. The freestanding urgent care center that was in our community, you know, it's really about providing an exceptional patient experience. And if we are providing an integrated, exceptional patient experience, the um, outside of that system um, almost can become a non-issue and actually don't exist in our community anymore. But it, the thing I want to um, really speak about was really on uh, Representative Lippert. I want to really mention how key your comment was, and Jeff, you played off from it, but it, it really gets me excited to think about alignment alignment within our organization, which we grapple with that because we're changing inside of our organization about that big blue age and what we're becoming. Um, alignment um, across our organization, I chair the Hospital Association Board, and that collective impact so we're doing things consistently across our communities to provide the best care, ACO, brings us together to do that, so we're integrating. And the other thing is, what about this system? Is it about going into a larger corporate structure? Or really, is it about aligning across our community, um, the accountable communities for health? And do we create an umbrella so that we can consolidate administrative functions? We've all got HRs, and we've all got IT, and we've all these things. So we think about merging into bigger. Or do we integrate across our community? Because that's where the capitated system aligns with where is the patient? Is it in our hospital? Is it in primary care? Is it in home health? Is it long-term care? Is it in public health, mental health? Across our community, that is amazing alignment that's happening across our communities. And if we can align the political good and the regulatory good um, that allows us the flexibility to lead and design that. Our hospitals are big in our community, they serve many things. We're redefining. But can you imagine if we can align all of us together, take away the skepticism and the suspicion, and align our resources and our intentions for the greater good? We're there, the hospitals are there. We're funding so much of this right now. We're totally in. And I think the word alignment is powerful. And I think in Vermont, we're unstoppable if we can do that. So thank you for that. So at this point, I guess we will open it up to uh, the general public. Oh, sorry, Tom. That's OK. Um, so my, my question kind of goes back to um, the slide that was the uh, crossing the shaky bridge. And two thoughts crossed my mind was um, that uh, the cost shift makes it pretty shaky, um, as does uh, the resulting impact on uh, insurance premiums, especially for people that don't have the help of an employer, like those in the QHP population. And so, you know, as an example of the magnitude of the cost shift, I, if we can look at the last 2019 hospital budget process, where the ask of the hospitals collectively was uh, $85 million and that the hospitals projected that they would only get 3.4 million or 3.9% of that from uh, Medicaid um, and that they would um, get uh, 64 million or 76% of that from commercial insurers. And so as that trans, that commercial insurance pressure translates through to the, the rate setting structure, the rate setting structure, um, you, you know, we have premiums out there for the low cost bronze plan uh, in Vermont that uh, if you're below 400% of poverty, it's $150 a month premium. If you're above 400% of poverty, it uh, uh, rises to $850 a month premium, uh, a huge increase with very large deductibles uh, of five and, and uh, $6,000. So I'm just wondering if you, at the hospital level, or just you know, collectively, 
you know, are seeing that there might be some collateral damage here in terms of this transition from fee for service to fixed prospective payment um, um, as uh, costs are hopefully trending down, population health is improving, but until we get there, we still have these costs in the insurance system uh, that are putting uh, some Vermonters um, uh, in jeopardy. <laughs> I'm holding the mic. <laughs> a dangerous thing. I mean, I think you know it, the the cost shift, of course, is, is a symptom of of, uh, of underfunded government programs, and and that's something we need to um, that, that the hospital association, not just mine, but the national one and ones across the country, are paying attention to every day. Look, I think I think Eric's slide was really. Um, effectively symbolic because you know the, the the metaphor we use here in Vermont more often is is a foot in each canoe, um, and and making that transition and all of the sort of downstream implications of that from what it means for the cost shift to what it means for risk um, are things that we're grappling with and and things that I think um, any health reform journey involves some some stumbling and some you picking yourself back up and I think we have to figure all those things out. Um, as far as sort of the, the dynamic, um, uh, from a more financial standpoint, I would want to phone a friend or ask someone else. <laughs> we have questions here. <laughs> so, Dr. Yes. Hi, uh, my name is Amber here. I'm a family physician in a rural clinic in Cambridge, Vermont, and also an addiction medicine specialist in Burlington. Um, and I, I think um, Mr. Pelham did refer to the issue of what sounds like, you know, the underinsured, or as I like to call them, partially uninsured. Uh, and 36% of Vermonters are partially un uninsured, 3% are, are completely. And as a primary care doctor in an independent practice, we still actually have paper charts, we're seeing patients that self-ration care because, let's face it, primary care is pretty much the only discretionary care that people have when they have huge out-of-pocket costs. And to me, that seems to be the huge linchpin because I see people that avoid care and are sicker as a result, and we know studies show that they're sicker, they die younger as a result of having either no insurance or bad insurance. So, I mean, it really seems to me that this all begs for a system. And you are talking about a delivery system and changes to that and delivery system costs, but we're not talking about patient costs. And that is crucial to the quality of care that you're all talking about. I have been, you know, screaming for single payer for years. I still am. But we are we actually proposing that we have a publicly funded universal primary care system that would include mental health and substance abuse services publicly paid for so there would be first dollar coverage which could marry with this ACO. Because it seems to me that if we encourage people, we'd probably be a great, um, I think it would be a good recruiting tool for, for primary care physicians and nurse practitioners to want to stay in Vermont uh, and be here. We know in Rhode Island it was very effective in terms of reducing their overall cost when they increased their spend rate. But now we're talking about in helping patients um, and, and Vermonters, every Vermonter, Per, you know, so that they could afford those out-of-pocket costs and wouldn't make those self-rationing decisions. And Mr. Shell, I really want to put the spot on you. <laughs> <laughs> I know, I was trying to hide. <laughs> <laughs> uh, well. Yeah, I, you, you, a couple of things that, that, that really resonate with me is so the system, right? The systems, and, 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 I, and I get back to that systems of care around the aggregating payment system of a population uh, a based payment system and, and the need for aggregation and, and coming together. So that's that that's that's one thing. And I and I think as the farther we move along towards this progression of payment, we are going to see that aggregations people come together in systems. In terms of the the, the patients themselves and the cost of patients, um, you know, one comment was, you know, I talked about the fact that eventually, essentially we've gotten too expensive and we've got to give back. We have got to give back to GDP um, our confiscation of excess uh, of dollars and we've got to cre create systems. We've got to reduce some of the supply of sick care services. 
we've got to invest in healthcare services and give back to GDP and make us a lower cost system overall for patients. In terms of one, you know, individual patients and the, the dollars that they're paying, um, you know, charity, there's charity care programs, there's you know, discount programs, there's all kinds of things out there to offer one-on-one -on -one patients, but I'm not sure if that's what you're getting at, especially when you're in your private practice and you have to keep the doors open. Um, Next. <laughs> you had a lot of study. Yeah. Publicly funded primary care. Well, it's yeah. fair enough. Eric's expertise is not in coverage programs. It's, ah, in, yeah. uh, it's in other areas. So I don't think it's really fair to put that question to him, given. How about the rest of the panel? So, so just in terms of publicly funded primary care, so yeah. there, I do believe in, and uh, right now we're spending a fraction of what we should be spending in primary care. And, you know, there right now there's there's proposals in front of the you know, American Academy of Family Practice around kind of you know doubling the investment in primary care to create some sustainability there and some investment, um, you know, that whole team-based care approach where we leverage up the primary care doctors with the advanced practice providers, nurses, others, and get that out there now. I do think that that's the case, and I think Washington, D.C. sees that as the case, that, that we make this excess investment in this primary care model, and I think we're going to see some, some, some opportunities for that coming out here in the next six months. Um, but how we fund that publicly, I'm not sure I'm willing to comment on that. So a key goal of the all payer model is to try to put <clears throat> more emphasis on primary care, and I just want to stress that point. Ian Davis. Uh, yes, this is a this is a comment concealed in a question to both Eric and Steve Gordon. Uh, I, I'm curious about what they they think about the political slash regulatory environment that our whole project is working in. What we really have here, it seems to me, is a split between the le great legislative power of the Green Mountain Care Board, okay, but without great knowledge of the details of the medical delivery system on the one hand. And then one care, which has, uh, which has, which is the repository of the medical judgment of the of the medical community in Vermont, but without much political power, actually not much political power. So, so my question is this: In Eric's comments, which are by far the best analysis I've ever I've ever heard about the way that the market and price forces and supply and demand and all of that begin to operate on the system. And then Steve's comment that who's the real decider here and it's the boards, okay? It's the boards of these hospitals. I just, I just want to ask Steve this. He's in southeastern Vermont, okay? In southeastern Vermont, so, some years ago when I was a regulator, we had Springfield, we had Rockingham, and we had Brattleboro, okay? Right now, we have Rockingham Hospital is gone. Springfield Hospital is really, really hurting. That's the most polite way I can put it. And what's, what's left is Brattleboro. Does Steve really, th on the one hand, first question, does Steve really think that the boards in Springfield and the boards in, Ro in Bellows Falls really decided they didn't want a hospital? Is that really what happened? I don't think so. My second question is, I'd love to hear Eric take his really most incredibly illuminating view of how the cogs and pieces of this system work and ask him what he thinks of the way where it's the political environment that's set up in Vermont. Sorry about that so long. Thank you. No problem. We'll start with Steve. <laughs> Am I responding to a question or a comment? Thank you. Thank you. So, no, I don't. Um, I think it's incumbent on the boards um, and incumbent on the CEOs. Um, to educate so that the community is never left without access to care, whatever that might take form. Could take form of a FQHC, which Springfield, um, similar to Dan's hospital, the hospital actually reports up to the FQHC. Um, that's a requirement from uh, FQHC uh, that can't be owned by a, uh, by a hospital. But I think it's incumbent on the, on the boards to think about What's it going to look like in five years? What are we going to look like in 10 years? And our board um, identified those services that are critical need in our community, whether it's emergency department, primary care is always number one. So um, it's not that the board makes that determination, it's the um, environment around us 
that puts pressures on the board that has to be educated to respond to those pressures. You know, in Brattleboro's case, um, um, we're not going to be the last man standing, obviously, in, in southeastern um, uh, Vermont, but we're focused on our partnerships, whether that's with Cheshire Medical and Keene or with Dartmouth. And, you know, over time, and we've had the strategic partnership, over time, that relationship's going to uh, continue to grow and, and evolve, probably similar to what you've seen in other hospitals like Mount Escutney becoming part of a system. And I might be provocative, but I think over the next probably five years in Vermont, you're going to see something very, very similar to what happened in New Hampshire. And I, I ran uh, a Hospital Corporation of America Hospital, an HCA hospital, for 13 years in Derry, New Hampshire, an HCA's largest for-profit chain in the country. And we had Derry and we had Portsmouth. Now HCA is picking up Exeter Hospital, Mass General. I'm sorry, not Exeter, uh, Frisbee. Ma Mass General is coming in to uh, southern New Hampshire and picking up Exeter Hospital. And as Kevin said, you're going to have, out of those 26 hospitals, one or two still independent. That's, the, that's what's going on in this country. Because we're going to continue to get squeezed on our overhead, whether it's how many CEOs you have, how are you going to pay for your, um, your expenses, your back office functions, centralizing those? I think you're going to see, some, uh, over the next five to ten years, substantial changes in the landscape of Vermont, similar to what you've seen in the rest of the country and what you're seeing next door as well. I was a CEO in Massachusetts for several years. How many hospitals are still independent in Massachusetts? Not many. Not many. And even now, the systems in Massachusetts, like Leahy and BI, are merging. So it's going to—it's a transformation, and we're responding to the needs of our patients, the needs of the regulators, the economic uh, realities that we're facing, um, and we're going to continue to to uh, to change and to evolve. And, and I don't know, Ham, if that answered your question, but no, it's, uh, it's, but I, but I think it's it's really in response to the functional imperatives. What do you have to do to be successful under a population-based payment, this new payment system? And it's aggregating lives to diversify insurance risk and scale to diversify cost, as well as create systems of care to manage the entire uh, range of the, the scope of services that are going to be necessary for a population. And that's why when you said in five years, it's likely Vermont's going to be rolled up just like others. I agree with that completely, but it's to meet these functional imperatives of a new payment system. But my question is, what do you think of this political structure that we have to get there? So the goal so is clear. Let me let me just say that um, I I haven't been in Vermont since we helped convert Middlebury to Critical Access Hospital several years ago. <laughs> other than passing through from Albany across the Green Mountains, um, so I'm, I you know I laid out a case for how I think just the economic forces are going and the imperatives and what's going to happen. But in terms of the political, what's going on here politically, I think either um, Kevin or Jeff would be much better positioned. <laughs> I'm not touching the politics, but so I will say, full disclosure, that uh, my firm, Helms & Company, was the firm that was brought in by Rockingham Hospital. And to Steve's point, what we did, I wasn't there, I, you know, but my partners who've long since retired tell me, what they did was they educated the board about the economic reality. They also looked at the population that was being served. They also looked at what services were available in a reasonable geographic distance around them. And then they asked the board, what services are we providing that would be a hardship for our population to get elsewhere that we can provide in a competent, quality, and effective way? And oh, by the way, they added to that, we've noticed that five of our board members have got surgery and all of you left town and went to another hospital to receive that surgery. And when the board really went through that thoughtful process, weighing all the different perspectives, they came to the, de to the decision to shut the hospital down. Ham, the only thing I would add is that, that I think in, in our current, in, in the Vermont's regulatory structure and given the goals of the all-payer model, the most important thing we can do is make sure that we're staying in partnership with the Green Mountain Care Board. And I think that's been happening more and more with hospitals telling their stories, having individual dialogues, um, and, and just trying to make sure that we're working through all those questions together. 
Okay, we have time for one more question. Susan. Um, Susan Aronoff from the Vermont Developmental Disabilities Council. And this is for Eric. I don't know if it's possible for you easily to pull up your slide number nine where you had the interposable reading traces at the rural hospitals. This was the this was a slide on the the, 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 the uh, inpatient proposed regs that were finalized in August, where rural hospitals received an update factor, uh, received an update factor of 1.1 1 .1 percent. One more. Yeah. So in the circle for rural hospitals, it's 1.1 percent. Below that, it says major teaching, 2.6 percent. <clears throat> I was wondering if either you or maybe the guy from One Care could talk about how this payment model, <laughs> um, sorry, Kevin, um, how the all pair model will ameliorate. Well, first, maybe you could just say, what's the takeaway? What's the implication of the difference between 2.6% increase and a 1.1% for teaching hospitals, rural hospitals? Then my real question is, how would the all pair model mitigate or ameliorate the impacts of that pay differential for our rural hospital participants. Yeah, I, I, the way I the way I look at it is when costs are going up five and a half percent, whether you're two point six or one point one, either one of them, you're behind the game, and leading to those increased negative Medicare margins, and so. You know, I don't. I, I I knew at one point the difference. I thought it had to do with um, uh, site neutrality on the pra on, on on provider based practices of hospitals and rural hospitals. I think that's what had a piece of it, and it also had to do with the 340B program. But I'm not. I can't. I, I'd have to go back and do the regs. Um, but but I think um, Kevin's probably going to be in a that that guy. <laughs> I, I, I grew up in Halifax, Vermont, but I left when I was 18, so I'm new to be back in Vermont. Um, uh, so at the ACL level, we do not do contracts and payment arrangements with the providers. We live with the <clears throat> economic arrangements that the various payers have, have in place with their providers. What we do is we take responsibility for the aggregate spend. But what we can do, as I mentioned in, in my presentation, we do, under the ACO, uh, have the ability to move some money around. So we do have the larger hospitals make a bigger contribution to the population health investments and to the cost of ACO operations. So that's one way we're able to get some support from the larger hospitals to some of the small hospitals. But we do not do contracts with any of the providers. It's the rates that are negotiated or agreed upon or set by regulatory statute um, that we live with on all of our peer contracts. So, if I understand you, whatever impact that might have on the hospitals, one compared to another, the payment model from the ACO doesn't impact that differential. The reimbursement that the providers receive for the services rendered is not impacted. We, but we are responsible to work within that fixed budget. So if the spend goes over the fixed budget, then there's going to be, you know, uh, repayments essentially by the parties. But we don't get into setting any reimbursement rates between payers and providers. So with that, I think we're going to uh, try to wrap this up since we're already over time. And uh, again, I want to give the uh, panel a big round of applause. So, uh, panel, feel free to um, step down, stretch your legs, whatever. I still have to finish up a few uh, minor things here at the board. So, uh, the next item on the agenda is old business. It's an old business to come before the board.
Budgets. Obviously, the rebase was discussed and incorporated into the 19 guidance. Um, and that's basically the extent of what I did to look into it. And again, I think it's really a question of what did the board intend when it rebased the budgets? Did it intend to actually change the 18 budget that you initially ordered, or was it intending to? Um, set a new starting point for FY19 that was more realistic and in line with uh, actual performance, both 17 actuals and projected 18. Questions with Mike? Okay. So we asked uh, the uh, general counsel to come back with questions. I don't think it's uh, fair to let this linger if uh, there's an interest in having additional enforcement hearings, I think we should decide sooner rather than later. I'm not saying that that necessarily has to be decided today. I think ideally it would be wise to decide it today. Um, but at the latest, I think uh, um, next Monday would be the absolute limit. And uh, so at this time, I'll, I'll see if anybody um, has any motion to offer. Maureen? <laughs> Well, I think maybe having discussion, or we have to have a motion first. Um, discussion's fine. Yeah. Um, you know, I, I think the intent when we did the, what I perceived the intent was when we changed the rebasing was for 19 budgeting, so that we could um, make sure that, you know, we, we understood that 17 came in higher, and let's roll the trend for 19. I think we were silent on what that would mean, if anything, for 18 and enforcement. Um, and I think in consideration, there are a few factors that would go into consideration. Um, there were two hospitals that we changed, um, UVM and Porter. Uh, UVM at the time, we did do uh, enforcement and Porter, we did not do enforcement because, again, this is what my perception was for Porter. Um, you know, they're really just coming out and improving their operations, um, shifting in with with the um, with, with the network, and you know, had not yet really seen a big change. Um, I would say, with looking at the performance for 18. Um, on both the top line and the bottom line. So the top line, we clearly know there was over 2% to their budgets for both UVM and for Porter, but not to the rebase. Um, and profitability for UVM was less at operating 
margin, slightly higher at total margin. Um, Porter was up significantly for total margin, including um, some adjustments they did for reserve. So I, I think we didn't do anything in for enforcement on Porter in the past, uh, last year. And so I, I do think that we should um, at least have the hospitals present. And I would actually say, you know, and this is up for discussion, but as far as for UBM, whether we actually do any enforcement or we have a review. I mean, one of the things that I have pushed for in the past is that we really only formally see the hospitals under the budget process and then under the 18 actuals for review if we, or the actuals for review if we bring them forward, but it's not part of the process for them to come in. I mean, and some of the hospitals come in for other reasons. Um, but I think it would be worth the board hearing from those hospitals, particularly the largest one in the network, on you know what's going on, what happened for 18, where they're trending for 19, um, and you know whether we make a decision now, whether that's in for under enforcement or under a you know have them come in and meet with us. So that's that's kind of my take. So I, I do think the board needs to make a decision about whether they're bringing them in enforcement or a, a discussion and presentation. I don't know if that needs to be made today, but I think before we send out a letter, the board does need to make that decision. Okay, other discussion from the board? I'm happy to chime in. Um, I think that while the rebasing was designed to uh, Next to, to sort of write budget to reflect the reality of the 17 actuals for fiscal year 19 to make sure that that budget reflects the reality. The fact that we actually allow that increased volume or increased utilization into the fiscal year 19 budget in some sense validates, for me, at least in my mind, that validated that that utilization was real to the extent that UBM had been having large volume from 14, 15, 16, 17, they were over, going over uh, for several years and having this volume that just moved through the system. We finally rebased in 18 for 19. That's the same volume. In fact, that volume overage was what we uh, enforced when we asked them to reimagine the mental health uh, inpatients. So in some sense, they've already been enforced on that same volume. So having them come in again, to me, doesn't make a lot of sense because it's the same volume that we're talking about. We've right-sized it. We've moved forward. Their actuals came in 0.14% over that rebase. So they pretty much hit for 18 what they what we right-sized them for. With respect to Porter, um, I think that it's true that they've been, they, you know, they had some financial difficulties over the years. And I think what some of that increased volume was, to some degree, was a result of that affiliation. That affiliation, first of all, gave them branding which increases volume, but second of all, it, uh, it's also a function of sending the care down from the medical center back into the community, right care, right time, right place. And so I think, to the, and they came in 18, if we look at their rebasing, they came in an 18.64% under. So my sense is the rebasing you know, made the appropriate budget adjustment. And to go back and enforce at this point doesn't seem to me to make as much sense as saying, yep, we've got it right now, let's move forward. Um, I just want to add another comment, which is one of my concerns is that um, the, these two hospitals came in in August of 2017 and presented us their budget for 2018. At that time, they had 11 months of data that they could be working with. Even though their budget presentation may have been based on six months of data, they're a sophisticated network. They had 10 months of actuals at least through, um, through July. And you know we were mid-August. And so I just feel that they owned that budget. They came in and presented that budget knowing where 17 was trending. They came in and met exactly or pretty close to what we had given for guidance. And I'm just not sure at that time how they could not have seen that they would have need to have had a higher number and why they did not come in at that time with that. And that, that's one of the things that does 
bother me because, you know, had they come in at that time, we may have made different decisions. If they had come in and said, you know, 17 is going to be much higher, we need to make 18 higher. But whether that was an actual choice to wait until enforcement or whether it was we really think we're going to come in flat to 17 and that's what we're going to put in 18. So that's what bothered me a little bit is they owned their forecast and they came in and did that. In March, when the actuals came in for 2017 and we had, you know, at that time the knowledge of what their budget was for 18 and they would have had to come down year over year for 18 and then from that we would have built 19 because we built, built on the budget. We said, wait a minute, this doesn't really make a lot of sense. Let's, let's, you know, pro forma adjust 18 forward uh, or 19 forward from 17. And that's what we did. And kind of disregarded where their budget had been for 18. Um, you know, so that, that, that's part of the reason why I would at least like them to come in and have that discussion because I don't want to perpetuate that situation coming into, you know, as we do the 2020 budget. Um, the other thing I have said in the past, and I will say again, is you know I kind of don't think you, have, you need to pay for your sins twice, and we did we did do enforcement for UVM last year, and you know then they came in, what we would have given them is 3.4 percent year over year. We didn't do anything with Porter. We kind of put that by the wayside, saying let's see where this shakes out, and, and that's why you know I I feel that possibly for Porter, we should look at some enforcement. For UVM, we, we did make adjustments the year before, and then if we did it again, you're kind of based in on that same base. You know, however, I do think there should be some response from the network, or from the hospitals in this case, is, is why did they come in here and present that budget in August? And I believe, I'm pretty sure we challenged that in the budget process, saying you're tracking way ahead, are you sure this is where you're gonna be? Because at that time, you know, the reported numbers were through, I think, about April. So they had six months of data they were tracking ahead. So I just want to make sure that everyone's taking our process seriously when we come into budgets and that, the, you know, the best budgets are being presented and that, you know, they own that budget. Um, we made the adjustments to rebase it, um, but at that time didn't do any enforcement. So that, that's why, you know, I, I do feel that there is a responsibility. Mike, one of the things I'd ask of you to look, look into, I have this vague recollection that they asked to rebase earlier. This wasn't their first request to rebase, but we had denied an earlier request. Did you be able to find that out? Right. All right. Or 17? At some point earlier than in 18 that they had, they had recognized, UVM had recognized this volume flowing this, through the system and had asked for a rebase and, and the board did not. Is there? The only time I know that there was a rebase for UVM was when they came in for actuals. They didn't mean request them. Oh, a request. 15 came in and then they said they wanted to um, use the excess for community housing, community health needs for housing, and then they were going to adjust the commercial rate. And that was approved. That was for fiscal year 15 which would have gone into their 17 budget. Okay. So 17 kind of was rebased. And then for 17, I don't, I have not been able to see any requests in my documents, okay. but there was a, as of January um, 2018 of their 17 data, they said they were already over but they were going to take a zero commercial rate. And that was the only piece that I saw. They didn't say anything about being rebased. Okay. I might have misunderstood. No, my bad. I trust your memory. I'm also probably was not in the loop for some of the data. <coughs> Yeah, and I think what we have seen is hospitals have come into the budget process and asked for amounts over, since we go budget to budget, which there's some issues with doing that, but since we go budget to budget, hospitals have come in and asked for higher than that and have reconciled why they need that at that time, case in point, um, Southwestern. And these hospitals had the opportunity to do that when they came in and they could have said, look, we're tracking way ahead for, you know, for 2017, therefore for 2018, it really, you know, we really need to make some adjustments. And we may have made different decisions at that time during the budget process. And that's what I'm saying. We, we, we didn't really get an opportunity to discuss this 
you know, with them, get the rationale for why they came in with that budget, you know, and, and how they could have done that differently. And I just would hope we won't have anything like this repeat again. So that when hospitals come in for budget, they realize, you know, they need to tell us what's going on and where they're going to be, and, and they have the time at that point to make some adjustments to either keep within the numbers that we give or support why it should be higher. Case in point in our budget guidance, we also have the opportunity for all hospitals to let us know if they need to have the budget amended. It's in the guidance. It's a policy or a rule or, a rule or a guidance. We'll it. And even in their oath, they're supposed to uh, notify of any, uh, right. any uh, changes that may occur that will make it different. So, Robin. Uh, so I think we're, the way I'm sort of thinking about this as we're discussing it is uh, I do think that, to your point, Maureen, we were silent about 18 enforcement. And so that's a, it's kind of handy that this is coming up now, even though uh, it would have been nice to have thought about it when we talked about it then. Um, at, because if we do go into the next round of enforcement with the other hospitals and we're talking about rebasing, it's something we should try and think through and, and be clearer about. So that's one major takeaway for me that's not directly on point to whether we should bring these two in. I think if, I certainly want the hospitals also to take our process seriously and to update when necessary, because without that, I think it harms the integrity of the regulatory process. Um, I, I feel like that's a, a better discussion to have separate from an in individual enforcement, because to me, the enforcement is really about why are the, why it, are the numbers different than what was expected in terms of, and whether that's something that we should try to uh, modify through a future action. Um, so I, I think where I'm at is I, because we were silent on it, I would not necessarily uh, enforce in an ambiguous situation like this, but I do like your idea, Maureen, of, of having realities. And those realities, as Maureen was saying, they had 10 months of data. They, the, the budget should reflect the reality of what they're observing. Um, and I wonder if, if a, a middle ground here might be drafting a letter to the hospitals, articulating the importance of, of, of our process and of the expectations of what goes into their budget submissions, reflecting their actions. And to the extent that maybe a, a meeting with you know, Kevin and some of the hospitals, not in a formal hearing process, but in a, an informal setting, might be a a middle ground there. Oh, yeah, I think where I'm conflicted is, you know, I, I, I agree with Kevin. I don't think we were completely silent. I think I also referred to when we were talking about the mental health and, and giving back of the 21 million that there may be more, depending where they came out the next year and if they were over in 18, which they were not. But. You know, what's not clear is the guidance that, w what we decided last week was that any hospital that was 2% over, we were bringing in 2% over budget. These hospitals are 2% over budget. And, you know, without having a clear direction on is the rebase the new budget, which I don't think we ever said that it was the new, new budget for 18. When you read all the documents, and even some of the, the documents that were sent from UVM back to us, they were saying, we, we, we need to adjust this so that we have a 19 budget base to work from. So we're, we can start from this number for 19. So I think we were pretty clear on that. And I think the other thing that we did is we said, we're bringing hospitals in who are over 2% uh, of their budget. And they're over 2% of their budget in, in these cases. So I'm not really sure how that would then, you know, would then say we don't need to do that because we adjusted the mid-year. We adjusted mid-year for 19 so that we didn't have this problem three years in a row is the way I was looking at it from, you know, 17. But again, I just feel they owned their budget in 18 with 10 months of data and they didn't come in with that and they still should come in for a discussion whether or not we do anything is, 
is, you know, will be up for discussion. And, you know, I, I can see there's the way this discussion is going. I'm not sure that we would necessarily do something, but I think having that review based on, the, you know, what we said, which is those two and a half, you know, minus two and a half and plus two. I think the part that I'm struggling with is if we brought them in for enforcement and we wanted to do something, we've rebased 19. So what are we going to do? I mean, there, it, it sort of, it, that's why I, I see it as uh, hard to look at it in enforcement because usually what you do in enforcement is in the, like you're adjusting something in the future, but we've already adjusted something in the future. So that, that's just where I intellectually am struggling with, with um, it as an enforcement action per se because I don't, I, I think, I don't quite see what the possibilities are. Now we have time between now and you know if we were to have a hearing to try and figure out what the options are, but um, that's that's where I'm kind of stuck, I guess. And I think there are options. You could even uh, reduce the commercial rate. Um, there are a number of options that uh, could be there. Um, but with that being said, if if the argument is just that. Um, The demographics change, which we agreed to, and um, we're going to do it. I, at the end of the day, I would hate to see us take an action against a hospital that has already committed, even though the the enforcement last year was for uh, setting aside $21 million on the inpatient acute psych beds. It's going to cost a heck of a lot more than $21 million. I think we all acknowledge that. And so I think at the end of the day, what it boils down to is whether we think it's worthwhile to call them in for consistency and have that discussion with them, or if we say for efficiency, we won't put them through that process because we can't see ourselves taking a corrective action, then we don't call them in. And that's just for UVM. I think UVM and Porter are two separate discussions here. And um, to me, I, I don't care which way we go. I just wish we would make a decision, <laughs> quite frankly. Does anybody wish to make a motion? So I would just ask all my colleagues to um, realize that it's not fair to leave people out hanging either, and that I would hope that at Monday's meeting, we could make a decision one way or the other. I'll make a motion. You're free at any time. Okay. All right. I would make a motion that um, we bring in Porter for um, a discussion um, based on being 2% over and not taking any action um, last year on their overage. And that we do not bring UVM in on an enforcement hearing, but we do have them come in and present to us on, you know, just an update of what went on in 2018 and what's going on in 2019, which I think is a good practice to do with the largest hospital in the network to have some more public conversation with them about what's going on. Okay, is there a second? I'll second for purposes of the, so that we can actually discuss it. Both. <laughs> Thank you, Robin. Discussion. Tom. I'm just glad I voted no. <laughs> <laughs> I, I, you know, I know, you know, uh, I, I look back on it, I can remember March, and there was the, you know, the uh, presentation by Andy back then as to what to do uh, with the 2017 surplus, and, um, you know, uh, my uh, approach was to, you know, put seven million bucks into the mental health issue and the remainder into a charge reduction, um, and when that didn't prevail, I just presumed that the, um, you know, the, the projected overage, or that overage from 2017 was kind of built into the base, kind of right sides it, but um, I, uh, I'm not going to put, I don't want to put myself uh, in a position of trying to interpret what the rest of the board meant, uh, because I voted the other way. Um, and uh, so whatever 
kind of gets us on the best track with, with UVM in this regard. Something I think we should do. So, um, Maureen, I'm going to ask if, if we could divide the question. And I think uh, we'll take up uh, the UVM discussion first. And I think what I heard the motion was to just ask them to come in and discuss the budget. I don't see um, as big a um, time crunch on doing that since it's clear that there would be no enforcement. It's just a discussion. So I, I think that uh, um, that could even be just you know scheduled for um, a couple weeks out. Um, so uh, does anybody wish to um, have any further discussion on calling them in just for a discussion on their budget? Okay. All those in favor signify by saying aye. Aye. All those opposed? Nay. So I think I heard four to one. Okay. So the second question is on whether or not to hold an enforcement hearing for Porter. And um, is there discussion on that? Um, so for me, I, I, I'm with Porter, I agree with Jess that I feel like I heard the, the rationale last with the 17 enforcement. And I think uh, with the previous budget submissions or presentations where UVM talked about their service realignment, where they were moving services back to the community that are, were more appropriate to that community, thus, quite frankly, freeing up uh, capacity at the Academic Medical Center for more complicated or, or more acute situations. Um, I see that the in 17, I was convinced that the budget overage at Porter was a result of that service realignment, and I do think it's appropriate realignment. So uh, I, and I don't think we're gonna see a difference in explanation for the, for 18. So, uh, because of that and because of the rebase, I would I would bring them in. So that's where I am on that one. So I'd like to ask a question, and I'm not sure if Lori might have an answer to this. I know it's putting you on the spot, um, or maybe Jess would have an answer as the dean of the board, even though she hates being called that. Um, was there a period when Porter was going through their period of struggles where they had um, a decline or less than a growth rate in EMPR than the other hospitals that once they got back on track, um, they caught up to that. Does anybody know the history? Um, I definitely know they were struggling. Um, we have to see some of them, our charts, but um, the way I understood they were starting to be in the black in 17 and 18. Yeah, I'm not so, I'm not, the question really isn't about margins. The question is what their growth in their uh, revenues were. Do you have any recollection, Jess? I wouldn't want to put a number on it. I mean, okay. I know they were struggling. Their day's cash on hand were quite low. Exactly. I mean, they were in the red. And I. We're, we're flipping through papers here to try to find the numbers. I believe the they weren't meeting the end of the watch. That's what the question is, yeah. really. I don't think so. They well, just Porter for the last four years on NPR went up 5.8, 6.3, 4.2, and then 2.7. From actual? Yeah. And Porter from an operating margin, and so I understand what you're saying, Robin, about we went through that last year, but we didn't make any, you know, part of this is not just top line, it's, it's contribution, right? And it's like if they, if they're making a lot more than what they were projected to make, how, if, if at all, do we get that back maybe to whether it's ratepayers or to the community? And their budget for, they had the largest shift in their operating budget from any of the hospitals. They were projected on a, on a margin to lose two million and they made a million five, but on a total margin, they were projected to make a million and they made 5.3, um, which is pretty healthy on where they were. And again, I don't know that we will, you know, when we get to enforcement, whether or not we will enforce, but, but that was the difference between last year because they weren't, hadn't made that change in profitability 
and this year they did. So that, that's, that's kind of to me what the difference was on that. You know, last year we opted not to do anything um, because they were not financially healthy. And when we go through it, we may still say, look, they've turned a corner, but they still need to get reserves set for the ACL, and we don't want to do anything. Um, Any other discussion? I guess I'll just share that I, I'm cognizant of the administrative burden that we place on hospitals. And we heard that a little bit in the panel today. And that's actually why I voted no on the UVM uh, decision, was that I didn't feel like I would learn anything new. It's not likely that we would do any enforcement, which actually we all agreed to. And we're imposing an administrative burden on this hospital to pull together presentations, to, which frankly, we already have the information about why the actions were what they were. And so I just want to add that into people's decision matrix is, is what kind of administrative burden are we placing on hospitals and particularly their finance teams while we're actually sending out budget guidance. They're also being asked to respond to our quality indicators and submit a new budget. Um, I just want to add that to uh, the conversation. So. If I could just comment on this one as well. Um, the first I knew this was an issue was yesterday when I got Mike's uh, email, and I might have missed something in my email chain, but you know, in your email you said that uh, some board members have been talking about this, and uh, I was totally out of the loop on it because it didn't. So uh, I haven't even gone back and tried to refresh myself as to, you know, and I'm sure I scribbled something on all the paperwork back then and, and, and have kept it. Um, so I, uh, you know, I feel, um, I feel a little bit sea in terms of this conversation because you know, my vote was a negative vote, and therefore it didn't matter uh, to an extent. And um, I only found out about this uh, issue as an issue late yesterday afternoon when I read Mike's email. So I just want to point out that at the last board meeting on March 27th, one week ago, the 27th, it was decided by this board, you were present, to ask Mike to come back to us at the next meeting when we would make a decision. Um, uh, <laughs> I, I, you know, it must be a senior moment or something, I guess, but I, I just, uh, uh, the, the, you know, the first engagement with it I had was when I read your email yesterday um, and, and didn't know where it was going to go from there. But because I had not gone to Mike about this before, but, um, uh, you know, I wonder if the maker of the motion would be willing to table it until Monday, give us a chance to go back and look at 2013 and 2014 and see what um, happened with their NPR in those years. Uh, I think that's about the time period where they struggled. I could be wrong, um, but I'd rather have the factual information in front of us. Clearly, um, Tom, I think you would appreciate a, a few more days. and. Um, Hopefully, we would make a, a better informed decision. Is that okay, Maureen? That's fine. So, without objection, we're going to table the motion until Monday's meeting. Just, and just be on the quarter. Just on quarter. And um, Lori and Kelly, if you could uh, start to uh, do some digging for us, that would be helpful. So, with that, is there any new business to come before the board? Seeing none, is there a motion to adjourn? So moved. Second. It's been moved and second to adjourn. All those in favor signify by saying aye. 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 Any of them?